Up next on C-SPAN, live coverage of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Terrorism, Narcotics, and International Operations, chaired by Senator John Kerry. Today's hearing began just a few moments ago, and we join the proceedings now in progress. Material witness in a trial um, It is a uh, witness in the trial of uh, DEA agent Camarena, uh, and we are uh, anxious not to uh, cause any problems with respect to that trial. So in accordance with uh, an agreement with the U.S. Attorney, we will hold that testimony for the time being, and that will be uh, made public at some time in the future, or there will be a public hearing. Secondly, Admiral Murphy was due to appear uh, tomorrow. He has been detained in uh, California, will not be able to be with us tomorrow. Tomorrow was going to be a short day anyway. So we felt that uh, the better thing to do was to proceed with the closed session and, uh, and then uh, hold our public hearings at a later time. Secondly, with respect to Monday, I already announced, but I want to reiterate, uh, there is an important segment of this story uh, that will be uh, told, uh, but it must be delayed from Monday uh, because of the need to have one of those key witnesses appear uh, in the middle district of Florida with the U.S. attorney there uh, again uh, in a matter that is currently underway. And again, uh, this committee does not want to uh, interfere with that process, and so we are honoring the request of the U.S. attorney and that will necessarily, because we want to tell a whole story rather than be sporadic, uh, delay the proceedings of that day. Uh, today we are going to proceed to tell one whole story, a piece of the Contra drug uh, story. But I want to emphasize that these hearings are about the larger aspect of narcotics and narcotics trafficking. And while today focuses uh, uh, obviously on the Contra question and on the private aid network question, what I really hope it will do is underscore the way in which clandestine efforts, uh, private aid networks, were taken advantage of by the narcotics process. And this is one more demonstration of how uh, the narcotics business has permeated uh, yet uh, another area uh, of our life, and also, I think, uh, taking advantage of, uh, of uh, pre-existing networks or of ones that were created for other purposes. And I think it is uh, an important story. There will be uh, five witnesses who will talk about their personal involvement in uh, either guns or narcotics or money as part of this network that was assisting the Contras. There will be one witness uh, whose name is mentioned by many of those other five uh, who will deny uh, some of his involvement. Uh, but I think uh, the story will be well told and fully told. Uh, the first witness is Mr. Gary Betzner. Mr. Betzner, I ask that you uh, stand, please, and raise your right hand so that I can swear you. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated. Would you state your full name, please? Gary Wayne Betzner. Your date of birth? 31941. Where were you born? Akron, Ohio. Okay. And you are currently incarcerated in federal prison, is that accurate? That's correct, sir. Okay. And what are you serving time for? Uh, importation of uh, cocaine okay. how many years is your sentence uh, 27 years and two months is this the first time you've ever been uh, uh, sentenced to jail uh, yes sir and is this uh, only your second arrest in your lifetime uh, yes sir uh, had you prior to this arrest or to this uh, period of involvement in drugs been involved with drugs uh, no sir I haven't okay. now Let's, uh, if we can, I want to elicit a few uh, questions from you that uh, tell something about you and your background. I'd like to ask you, you say you were born in Akron, Ohio, but you didn't grow up there, did you? 
Uh, no, sir. I understand my parents were just passing through. And where did you go to? Uh, Arkansas. Go to school in Arkansas? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Through what level? Uh, the senior year. Of high school? Uh, that's correct. What high school did you go to? Uh, Duvall's Bluff High. Where is that? Uh, it's in east central Arkansas on the White River, about 50 miles east of Little Rock. What did you do after high school? Uh, I went into the Navy. What, what, uh, how long are you in the Navy for? Uh, over four years, uh, what, five years counting reserve time. What years was that? Uh, 59 through uh, 63. What were your tours of duty? Uh, well, I uh, was on an aircraft carrier for a year, and I spent the balance of... Uh, what aircraft carrier did you serve on? Uh, the USS Hancock, CVA-19, on the West Coast. Um, we toured um, the Far East. And then your subsequent tours? Uh, my subsequent tours, I uh, went to uh, a Navy school for approximately uh, six months. And then I was assigned to uh, Patrol Squadron BP-17 out of Woodby Island, Washington. The my entire term. And you were honorably discharged? That's correct, sir. With what rating? Uh, I was an enlisted man, uh, E6, I believe. Yes. Did you had you previously uh, attended uh, uh, college at all? Uh, no, sir, I hadn't. I attended while I was uh, uh, in the Navy some, and uh, after I got I got out. During the course of your naval career, did you also do some anti-submarine warfare patrols? Uh, yes, sir. I approximately three years. Uh, I uh, flew three different tours in uh, Alaska. Uh, my specialty was electronic countermeasures. And did that come to serve you well in some of your uh, efforts in drug smuggling later on? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Okay. We'll get into some of that later. Uh, after you completed the uh, tour of service in the Navy, did you then go to college? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Where did you go to college? Uh, Arkansas State Teachers College. Did you graduate? Uh, no, sir, I didn't. How many years did you spend there? I quit um, after I'd gone to school there almost a year. What did you then begin to do? Well, I didn't know what I really wanted to do with my life at the time, and so because of my past experience, uh, I was hired by Global Associates, which was the logistic support contractor of the Pacific Missile Range out of Kwajalein, Marshall Islands. How long did you do that for? I was there for a year or so. Then? I left the island and uh, I uh, went back to terminate my employment after I got back to the States, went to uh, Bellingham, Washington, where I had, uh, I had friends. And then I later moved to New York. At some time, did you go to Arkansas and begin farming? Uh, yes, sir. I went back there. My parents had a farm, and uh, I went back there in uh, 65, 66, I believe, early 66. And at that time, you kind of settled down and became uh, a crop duster. Is that accurate? Uh, that's correct. When did you get your commercial pilot's license? I think I got it in 64. What ratings did you receive? Uh, at the time, I only had a commercial license. Since then, you have received what ratings? Uh, airline transport uh, pilot, multi-engine, commercial single multi-engine land and helicopter, and I'm also an uh, A&P mechanic. Now, are you, uh, while you were in Arkansas, you started a crop dusting business, is that correct? That's correct, sir. Did you also become a member of the JCs? Uh, yes, sir. I was a JC, uh, Mason, and uh, a charter member of the Shriners in Anchorage, Alaska. And did you achieve a position within the JCs? Were you once president of your JCs? Uh, that's correct, sir. Where was that? Uh, Hazen, Arkansas. Now, how long did you run the crop dusting business for? Uh, about 12 years. During what? Uh, when did you stop the crop dusting business? in 77. You went to Alaska for a period of time? Uh, yes, sir. I went to Alaska in 75, 76. Um, and you kind of drifted in Alaska a little bit? Uh, no, sir. I moved and bought a home in Anchorage. Uh, moved my family there. Uh, went to work for a company there that uh, ran helicopters for a while. And uh, What was the name of that company? Uh, International Air Taxi. And sometime you left Alaska? Uh, yes, sir, I did. 
Where did you go? Um, we moved back to California for a while, and uh, Newport Beach, and then after that we uh, moved back to Arkansas. What did you do when you got back to Arkansas? Uh, crop dusted, or began to crop dust. I was going to that year, but I uh, subsequently uh, got arrested in uh, Miami, Florida. Okay. Now, at some point then when you returned to Arkansas, uh, did you attempt uh, for the first time in your life to buy some cocaine? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Uh, you never tried it? Uh, no, sir, I actually haven't, no. Okay. And on this occasion when you tried to buy some, uh, you actually got busted during that first purchase, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir, it's true. And where were you busted? Uh, Miami, Florida. And w what happened after you got busted? What did you do? Well, after I was released on bail, I went back to Arkansas. What and, did you do? And crop dusted for a while. Okay. Then what? Uh, then I uh, jumped on. I was afraid of going to jail because uh, extenuating circumstances and the embarrassment of the whole thing and my parents and none of my family had ever uh, gone outside the law and they were good normal people. What did you do once you jumped bail? I uh, left uh, Arkansas on a motorcycle and, and went to California. And did you then become involved somehow in drug smuggling while you were running away from justice? Uh, yes sir, uh, early 1980. Describe how that came about. Well, I'd lived in Hawaii for a while and then Oregon, and I ran out of money and uh, uh, I acquired a job in uh, Miami and I moved down there. I had reestablished myself under another ID. And, you were then known as Lucas Harmony, is that correct? Yes, sir. That's a name you chose? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And did you then start to work for DECA aircraft? That's correct. What were you doing for them? Uh, just uh, general things, uh, washing airplanes, painting airplanes, uh, just general things like that. Were you doing any flying? Uh, no, sir, not at the time. You had an accident while you were on the job, correct? Yes, sir. I fell off of uh, an Air Florida 737 wing uh, between a check stand and broke the small bone in my left leg. So you were dur during a period of convalescence, you met a friend of yours who was involved in drug trafficking. Yes, sir. That's correct. And that was the beginning of your career? Yes, sir. Okay, would you describe how that began? Well, I met this guy and uh, he had a friend who had an airplane and they were in the business and uh, they're mostly... In, they're, mostly in, they're in what business? In the marijuana business. And one of them had a connection in uh, Columbia and he made arrangements and gave me the aircraft and... Uh, what, and kind, I, what kind of aircraft was that? Uh, this was an old uh, Twin Bonanza. Did he make an arrangement for you to fly to Columbia to pick up drugs? Oh, that's true. What year was this? I believe it was 19, early, 18, early 1980. Okay. Now, let me just uh, uh, caution you here as I have the other witnesses and I want to do this publicly because from here on in your testimony is, is, is very important to what this committee is looking at. Um, and I want to caution you that, uh, as you know, you're under pains and penalties of perjury here. You've sworn to tell the truth, and uh, this committee uh, does intend uh, to uh, hold any individual as accountable as we can in the full measure of the law if you don't tell us the truth. And I want to be certain that you understand that before we go on. I understand perfectly well. Your sentence right now is how long? Uh, 27 years and two months. Eligibility for parole is when? I haven't been at the parole board. I don't have any idea. Okay. And you have had no conversation with this committee or anyone uh, to do with it. Uh, have you regarding any parole or any kind of efforts uh, this committee would make on your behalf? None, none whatsoever. Now, and is it fair to say that you are also prepared to say to this committee some things that you have not yet said publicly? Uh, yes, sir. Now, uh, Mr. Betzner, what would you describe to us uh, this first drug venture you went on? You'd never flown down there before. How did you know where to go? Well, I'm a pilot, and um, I've had considerable navigation experience. <clears throat> so it was uh, relatively simple for me to do. I just uh, 
left uh, southern Florida and uh, the aircraft had eight hours of fuel and I made it to uh, northern Columbia, what they call the Wajira Desert, uh, the strip on the lake which is almost on the very tip of Columbia. Uh, I dead reckoned all the way down just by compass. Uh, the aircraft ha didn't have uh, any modern navigation equipment. Uh, it was in the daytime. I got there. Uh, the marijuana was there, but the gas wasn't. The gas got stuck in the desert, and so I didn't get fueled until probably 10 o'clock that evening. I took off. I flew back, uh, found the eastern tip of Cuba. It was a starlight night. Flew up the northern coast of Cuba, approximately 20, 12 to 15, 20 miles off the coast until I saw the lights of Miami. Uh, my designated uh, landing point was uh, the Keys in Florida. I arrived there. Uh, there was some trouble with the strip I was supposed to land on. I understand the customs or someone had was there and so... Now, how did you know that? Was there uh, somebody communicated, there to warn you? Yes, I communicated by radio to the ground. What, was it to the ground or to some other entity? Uh, to the people on the ground. Where, where were they? They were waiting for me to unload the aircraft. And they told you there was a problem? Right. So where did you go? I went to the next nearest strip because I was, had eight hours of fuel and I'd been in the air eight, eight and a half hours, as I recall. So I went into Marathon. How much were you paid for that run? I had originally contracted for $40,000, but because I saved the load, I charged the people an uh, extra ten grand. When you say you saved the load, when you got to Marathon, nobody was there or what? No one was there, and uh, I had to take care of it myself. Okay. Now, why, let me ask you a question uh, of curiosity, why would a drug effort that makes thousands of dollars, and here you are being paid 50000 and they're going to make a lot more on the load, not fly a more sophisticated, navigational, equipped plane? Well, these people were just young people that were uh, into uh, entrepreneurs, you might say, into uh, making a few dollars just in the start of their life. That's the way I picked up on it. So you just took whatever aircraft was available at that point? I took the only aircraft that they had available. Did you, in fact, get more sophisticated aircraft at a later time? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Okay. did. How many flights did you do for these people? Uh, th that, that person, I think I did another one for him and uh, a couple more for different people. Were they all to Columbia? Uh, no, they were a couple of to Jamaica. What did you pick up in Jamaica? Marijuana. Uh, did you bring them back to the same location in the United States? No, different locations. Do you want to name where you took them to? Well, uh, Gainesville. Uh, Southern Florida near Okeechobee and uh, what well, two near Okeechobee? Did you perform other surface other services for drug traffickers besides uh, pilot? In in what capacity? In any other capacity? Did you do any other things for them besides fly planes? Uh, yes, sir. I owned a, a company, and at a later date, this was after I. Uh, had uh, was actually in 83, 84, I had a, a company at uh, Tamiami Airport that did uh, aircraft maintenance, uh, mostly installing uh, tanks and uh, that sort of thing. Now, during these uh, four flights, did you have occasion to fly over into Cuba again? Uh, yes, sir. I went across Cuba three times. During these first four ventures? Yes, sir. Well, weren't you worried about uh, uh, violating Cuban airspace? Well, the, the first time I, I had to go across because my auxiliary tank that the people had installed for me uh, didn't function properly, and I didn't have enough fuel to go around the east end, so I had to go across Cuba. And it was an overcast day, and I was about 12,000 feet. Uh, I was in a single-engine aircraft, uh, one of those bonanzas that were approved for uh, aerobatics. And uh, they, they launched the MiGs on me, MiG-19s. And uh, I pulled out my shirt, and I was waving it like a, you know, a white shirt. And uh, they made several passes at me while I was, you know, leaving. I was going north. And, uh, and then it made another pass at me, and they, he wasn't coming around uh, to pull up beside me. He was coming up on my tail, so I rolled the aircraft upside down, inverted what they call a split S 
and uh, went through the clouds and I broke out uh, about 3,500 feet. I uh, went across uh, near an air base called uh, Camagüey Air Force Base. Lots of military equipment, aircraft, large and small. Um, went across the island going north, uh, down through a ravine, and uh, zigzagged all the way over to Jamaica. And uh, when I got to Jamaica, I uh, loaded my load, flew about 45 minutes west and headed north and uh, about 20 foot off the water. Uh, hit the mountains in Cuba and went back across Cuba in the daylight uh, on the ground and uh, sometimes I flew below the sugar cane, you know, and I made it across, <clears throat> had no problems. And uh, I got to Florida about five in the evening, southern Florida, and uh, flew to Gainesville. Uh, the, the guys were supposed to have a remote strip there, but they didn't. And uh, they hit a pig or something going out the strip and messed up the truck, and so I went into Gainesville, and, uh, and they had some people waiting for me there, and uh, that's about the end of that. Did you have any problems uh, with uh, customs or anybody coming into U.S. airspace? Uh, fortunately, no. Did you take any special measures to evade or avoid that? Uh, no, I didn't, other than fly low. And uh, at that time, as I recall, through the shipping channels uh, just uh, south of Key West, there, there was a considerable amount of shipping, and um, I would be below the, the ships on the water. And uh, if there was any radar, they wouldn't be able to detect me. And besides, when you're heading into the radar, you're less profile than you are when you're sideways to it. Um, how much of a load did you bring back uh, on those first four flights each time? Well, the first load was about 1,500 pounds. The second load was about uh, seven, 800 pounds of uh, sensimia, which is a more expensive uh, substance. Um, the other two loads were 15, 1,600 pounds in those aircraft. Did you develop an airplane modification business uh, for drug smugglers during this period of time? Uh, yes, sir. I was in that. Where did you handle that out of? Out of Tamiami. This was part of your avionics and mechanical operation? Oh, right. I had originally set it up to just service my own aircraft. And, but uh, I knew other smugglers and... Uh, you are rated as an avionics uh, technician yourself? Uh, yes, sir, I am. Okay. Now, um, how many hours of flight time did you have when you began your adventures as a drug uh, pilot? I would say 15,000 plus. So you were a very proficient pilot? I was a good flyer and a pilot. And when you distinguish the two, you're talking about uh, being able to fly by the seat of your pants versus the instruments. Is that uh, yes, sir. fair to say? Was the crop dusting good training for the kind of thing you had to do? Yeah, the best. Uh, after you ran these first four flights, did you then stop or did you become involved with other people? Um, no, I didn't stop. I became involved with other people. What did you become involved with then? Uh, well, I, I did a few myself and I, I lost uh, my first load. Uh, I lost, had bad fuel out of Columbia and I, and I had Queen Air and uh, I couldn't make it. So I had to go into Bimini. What kind of plane were you in? A Queen Air, a uh, Beechcraft Queen Air. And flying from Columbia? Uh, yes, sir. Back to the United States? Right. You lost your engines? Mm -hmm. What altitude were you at? Well, when I lost my engine. I was about uh, 5,000 feet uh, east of Andros. I lost one engine. And uh, it seems the fuel has bypass uh, filters, and the fuel uh, to the engine, engine was starving, or flooding out, actually. And uh, so I continued on, and I was about 50 feet off the water, approaching the Florida coast, and the other engine uh, fuel warning light came on. And so rather than go in the water, I had to uh, go to Bimini. And so I was near Bimini, and I tuned in a VOR, and the right engine quit, and the left engine quit, and I kept starting and restarting engines, and I made it into Bimini. What happened when you got to Bimini? Well, no one saw me, and I... I uh, ran the aircraft off the runway into the bushes where some other wrecked aircraft were, and uh, uh, we left the aircraft. And uh, my co-pilot uh, 
ran off. And uh, at this time, I had put so much into this that I just was determined to save it. And so I unloaded about 300 pounds into the uh, jungle. And, um, and I left and went up to sur survey the island and see what was going on. Anyway, I wound up uh, losing the load. And that night, uh, uh, I was arre arrested uh, with the Bahamians that helped me unload the rest of the marijuana. And uh, they held a gun on me. And uh, I finally admitted it was mine. And uh, I told the uh, sergeant that had the gun on me that I had 300 or 400 pounds in the weeds in the jungle and I'd give it to him if he'd let me have my aircraft. And uh, so he agreed and uh, the uh, Bahamians uh, shot the lock off of a DC-3 there and took two 55 gallon drums of uh, fuel and uh, <laughs> climbed up on my wings and poured it in the aircraft and, and uh, I took off. It was about 10.30 and I lost an engine on takeoff and I nursed it all the way to uh, Florida and I was trying to get into Opelika West but uh, I lost both engines and they wouldn't run anymore, so I feathered them and landed uh, after the tower had closed uh, in Opelika. At some time, very shortly thereafter, did you meet uh, Mr. George Morales? Yes, sir. I went back over to Bimini the next day uh, to why'd find... You, why'd you go back to Bimini? Uh, I was going to try to buy in the load that uh, I lost there back. And uh, when I got there, a uh, Bahamian introduced me to uh, George Morales' uh, employee, uh, Jairo Plata, who was a Colombian-American. And uh, Jairo uh, knew I was a pilot and what I was about, and so he introduced me to George. It was at the big game club. Uh, George was in a fishing tournament there, and he had a boat by the name of the Barbet. Very nice fellow, and uh, we struck up a rapport, and he just took me right into his family. And uh, Did he know that you dealt in drugs at that time? No, sir. I, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't a dealer. Uh, I'm not very good at that sort of thing. I'm just a pilot. Did know. he know that you flew drugs? Uh, yes, sir. He didn't know prior to that, but during the course of that conversation, he came to know that you did that. Yes, sir. And did you know anything about George Morales and his involvement with narcotics? No, I had never met the man before. Okay. Did you come to learn during that conversation uh, that he might be able to use your talents as a pilot? flying I, narcotics. Uh, yes, I did. Okay. And so, in fact, you entered into a business relationship with Mr. Morales to fly narcotics. Is that correct? That's correct. When did you do your first narcotics flight for Mr. George Morales? Uh, probably a week or two weeks, I think, uh, after I met him. Did you learn anything about George Morales, about his background, about things he did, what he was involved in? Uh, yes. As time went on, we became quite good friends. What did you learn about him? No, that it was from Bogota, Colombia, that he'd been in the construction business. Uh, uh, he would have been in import, export, and all kinds of different things. And uh, he's just a very charming, uh, witty, a nice guy to be around. Did you learn that he had any special talents with respect to boats? Oh, yes, he was into boats. And he was a smuggler when I met him. I mean, he, he was uh, quiet. Uh, he was into it at the time. He also uh, a com competitor, competitively, internationally, in speedboats? Uh, yes, he was, uh, when I met him, he was getting into it at that time in a big way, and, uh, and he, was, he later on he became a world's champion and raced all over the world. Now, how then did you come to do your first flight for George Morales? Well, George g gave me this old beat-up uh, Aztec and uh, just, just to see if I could do it, I guess, and it was my test, and so I was uh, successful. And uh, Where did you fly to? To Columbia and uh, back to uh, Great Harbor Key. I was supposed to go into another island, and, but I, I couldn't find the island, and uh, so I went into uh, another strip that was unlit, and, but it was a starlight night, and I found the strip, and I landed there, and uh, I had met, I had been in this place before, and uh, I had met a couple of Bahamians, and they just happened by luck to have been at the airport that night. And uh, we unloaded the aircraft, and they took it to the north end of the island, and, uh, and we got some gas out of the preacher's aircraft there and put in my Aztec, and I took off about two in the morning and, and finally found the island where we were supposed to meet. Was and, that, again, a flight from Columbia? Yes. 
Where did you pick up the goods in Colombia? Same place as before? Um, near there. Yeah, the the desert's quite large in northern Colombia. Um, approximately, as I recall, it was so many, probably uh, 30, 40 miles inland. So you landed with the Aztec. That was your first load for George Morales, and it went successfully. That's correct. Okay. Uh, did you have to pay off any Bahamian officials in order to be able to land or to bring the goods in? Well, the, actually, that's the first time we uh, started working in uh, Great Harbor. Uh, from from that experience on, we paid off the people, and uh, and from that experience on, we uh, worked out of Great Harbor. It became our home, so to speak. Now, when you say you paid off the people, did you personally pay people? Uh, I did a few uh, times later, but most of the time, uh, Jairo Plata uh, handled that aspect of it. I knew the Bahamians before he did, but there was uh, another operator working out of there by the name of uh, Enrique, Jose Enrique Lopez, alias Henry Lopez, uh, who was a former partner of uh, Kojak, a guy by the name of Kojak. I let the record show that the gentleman known as Kojak uh, testified uh, before this committee, um, I think a year and a half ago, and we have his uh, full testimony, which corroborates much of what these other witnesses uh, have said and will said. Uh, Mr. Kojak has since uh, deceased um, of uh, natural causes in the last year. Um, but that testimony, I believe, will be released at an appropriate time subsequent to this hearing. Now, did you uh, do some work with this gentleman named Kojak and Lopez? Uh, no, sir. I never worked with Kojak. Uh, he was, at the time, was a DEA informant. However, I did uh, work quite closely and became uh, good friends with uh, Henry Lopez. Uh, did, uh, how many flights did you then begin to do for Mr. Morales? I, I think that was in 1982. Uh, I did 50 for him uh, pretty quick. 50 flights? Yes, sir. All to where? All uh, Columbia? No, not all of them were to Columbia. I did a couple out of Jamaica in the no. beginning. What year are we talking about now? 81, 82, that area. What kind of plane? Did you graduate from an Aztec? Uh, yes, I uh, flew a, a 402 that uh, I had, that George Cessna had. Cessna 402? Yeah, and it was modified uh, considerably. Um, and then uh, I told George that we could do a whole lot better if I had a, a better aircraft, and, and uh, so we got a Panther. What kind of plane is a Panther? A Panther is a Piper Navajo. We had the early model, which was a light aircraft, and um, it has 350 horsepower Lycoming engines uh, with uh, four-bladed uh, Q-tip props. Um, this um, increases performance uh, considerably. What's the normal uh, gross of that plane that you could carry in marijuana? Well, most people can, with uh, say 240 gallons of fuel, they carry 17, 1800 pounds. Uh, this, this aircraft, uh, I used to fly it with 320 gallons of fuel and I've hauled as much as uh, 3,000 pounds. Did you get, uh, did uh, Mr. Morales buy several of these planes? Yeah, we, after a while we called his place the zoo. He had so many panthers around. How many panthers did he buy? Uh, I know four or five. So Mr. Morales had other pilots flying for him in addition to yourself? Uh, yes, sir. Did you get to know some of those other pilots? Uh, no. I, I, as you know, I was a fugitive and I, I carried myself that way. I didn't uh, associate in public or come and go. I, I met some people, but uh, the only pilot that I knew, uh, well, there were a couple, but uh, the only pilot that I knew was Richard Healy, who was George's chief pilot at aviation activities. Who, 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 did, who is Mr. Richard Healy? Um, he was uh, George's chief pilot, as I said, and uh, he was a Colombian-American. His, his father was American, his mother was Colombian, he was bilingual. Um, good helicopter pilot, good pilot, a nice fella. Uh, Where did he live? He lived in Miami. And who was he married to? Uh, to a girl named Marta. Uh, she used to be Marta Chamora, uh, and she married, she's a Nicaraguan, and uh, they were married and they had uh, one daughter. 
and the Richard Healy that was married to uh, Marta Healy uh, was also flying narcotics with you. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, sir. He made a few trips with me. And this is the same Marta Healy who at one time, or two times actually, was married to Adolfo Popo Tremoro. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. And Adolfo Popo Tremoro, you know to be one of the leaders of the uh, Southern Front Arde Contra movement. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. And did you know him to be somebody working with Aiden Pastora in Costa Rica? Uh, no, sir, I did not. Not at that time, no. Not at that time. You came to know that later. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Now, uh, the record should show here that uh, uh, Marta Healy is under subpoena to this committee. Uh, we have been uh, talking to her attorneys. Uh, she has still not appeared here in uh, Washington yet, but uh, she is at this moment under subpoena. Uh, did you fly both marijuana and cocaine in the course of these 50 flights? Uh, no, sir. Uh, marijuana and uh, pills. Qualudes? Uh, yes, sir. Where did the Qualudes come from? Colombia. Okay. You flew those all to the Bahamas? Yes, sir. And the nature of the operation was that you would offload in the Bahamas? Uh, yes, sir. And how would the drugs then come to the United States? Uh, by boat. Whose boats? Uh, George's, and uh, then he would have uh, other people contracted, uh, other smugglers, that, that, that was their specialty, mostly Cuban. What kind of boats would they use? Uh, just a varied amount of uh, the cigarette type. Uh, you know, speedboat. Did any Bahamian officials ever fly with you on any of these drug flights? Oh, yes, sir, on uh, several occasions. Uh, how did, what, what was it that got a Bahamian official into an aircraft with you on a drug flight? Well, I spent considerable time in the Bahamas uh, flying the baseball team around in Georgia's DC-3. Uh, Who's uh, base whose baseball team? Uh, the uh, different uh, Islands had different baseball teams, and uh, I don't recall each specific one. Uh, the police baseball team, uh, the defense baseball team, you know, and they were in the baseball. And I flew politicians around and officials around. That was just part of the service. And I got to know a lot of people, and, and then they got to know that I was a good pilot, and I suppose, and, and uh, so I offered to let them go along as co-pilot, which was just good business. And, uh, we usually paid them $15,000. When you say officials, can you be more precise about what kind of an official? Uh, yes, uh, uh, with the Bahamian police force, uh, officials. Uh, any customs? Or? Uh, not that I recall any customs or immigration. I, I, knew, I knew a lot of them, uh, but I think they made enough money that they made enough money otherwise that they didn't need to fly the aircraft. Uh, and some of the Defense Force people. What did you mean when you said that was part of the service, when you described flying the baseball teams around? What does part of the service mean? Well, George was always into being in control of the situation, and he's a good businessman, and so the politics in the Bahamas were uh, conducive to good business. And so he would, uh, you know, loan his aircraft to uh, different people uh, to just as, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, goodwill? Goodwill, yeah. How much did you have to pay officials in order to have them look the other way or take part? Well, you, we usually wanted to pay them about 15000 a trip, which was, was reasonable because uh, uh, customs and immigration get five apiece and the, and the uh, military or the police on the island would get five. And after a while they would get greedy. And so when they would get greedy, we, we, we started kicking it out on Loran fixes uh, off the island. And, and we had Bahamian uh, islanders working with us that would uh, pick the bales up and, and bring them back in. And then we'd load them on the speedboats and bring them home. Did you perfect water drops during that uh, process? Yes, sir, I did. Can you describe that? Well, we have uh, two boats out. Uh, 
approximately a mile and a half, two miles apart. Uh, at a certain position, a prearranged Loran fix, uh, they usually went in by uh, ground. They didn't have a Loran, but uh, I would use my Loran to uh, find them. And they would light flares, and uh, I would descend to about 100 feet on instruments and open the back door and have an experienced kicker there, and they would just uh, kick the bales out. What do you mean by an experienced kicker? Well, somebody that uh, wasn't afraid and to do the job, and they were strong, and uh, and uh, could do the job quickly. Had to make about three passes, and uh, and it was all in instruments. It was subsequently su several people lost their lives trying to do that, but uh, we did that, and then the Bahamians would uh, agree to our prices, and we'd usually go back and start landing again. How much money did you make working during this period? This was a, a first sort of period that you worked for Mr. Morales, correct? Mm -hmm. And this period went from when to when? I've talked to George about this too, and time is um, kind of a strange thing in, in those days. I would say the late 81 uh, to the end of 82. Uh, there was an eight month period in there where I did 50 trips uh, for George, and I did several for Henry, but I know there was 50 I did for uh, George. And uh, I made $2 million, 40000 a trip. He paid me for every trip. Did uh, you, during this uh, time, have occasion to again fly over Cuba? Um, w one day I was uh, teaching George to fly, and uh, and uh, we went into Havana. I don't ex I don't remember. I think it was in '83 sometime. Uh, George and I stayed in contact, and he would come by my house and leave notes and stuff like that. And I would meet him, and we'd go do things together, and he'd keep me up on what was going on. And he had had trouble after I left uh, because he had so much heat you know, with his indictments and things, and I couldn't stand that. Now, to your recollection, when was George indicted? Well, he was indicted in 1980 uh, with Richard Healy and uh, another fellow and Jairo Plata uh, for conspiracy on a DC-3 load into Bimini. And then he was indicted again in uh, 84, I think, or 80, uh, maybe in 82 and then one Somewhere in, in that vicinity. He had several different indictments, but nothing ever became of them that I know of. Now, you said you went into Havana. What uh -huh. do you mean by that? You just flew into Havana? Right, <laughs> right into Havana. How, how'd you manage to do that? Did you have well, clearance? Well, I, I didn't know at the time. George was just playing a trick on me. He said, do it, and so we did it. But uh, I landed and went there, and I stayed by the aircraft, and George left and came back about an hour later, and we departed. Did you have a special code or something that enabled you to get in? Not that I know of. Did you at some time get given a code to permit you to uh, overfly Cuba? Yes, uh, George gave me a code, a transponder code. What was the transponder code he gave you? 1301. And when did he give you that? In 82, 83, 82. Somewhere in that period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, did there come a time when you stopped flying for George for a period? Mm, uh, yes, sir. I uh, started, uh, I formed my own uh, little company there in uh, 83, middle of 83. Uh, when you say your own company, your own drug smuggling company or some other kind of company? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I bought several aircraft and, and uh, went into business. What kind of aircraft did you buy? <clears throat> well, the first one I purchased was a, uh, a, a twin Comanche that had uh, uh, 320, 340 gallons of fuel at a 3,000 nautical mile range and had an Omega system, which is a global navigation system in it. Is this, is this an airplane you bought from a Pennsylvania company? Yes, it is. Okay. This is a Pennsylvania company. It was called Air America? That's correct. And what kind of planes did they have? Well, Air America was an aircraft modification business, uh, long range fuel, engine modifications, uh, and that, that sort of thing. It was a, a place where people who wanted to have their aircraft modified went. And did you use this modified Comanche for more drug flights? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Okay. For cocaine flights? Yes, sir. From where to where? Uh, from Columbia to uh, the Middle District of Florida. Where were you operating out of? Uh, Lakeland. Dur during this 1983 period? Uh, Lakeland, Florida. Okay. Now, were you ever tracked by uh, DEA or others during this period of time? No. Okay. Uh, now, 
Now, you talked about Richard Healy. You knew Richard Healy was involved with flying narcotics, correct? Correct. Was Richard Healy also involved in assisting the uh, uh, Contras in Central America? Uh, yes, sir. In what way was he assisting them? I don't know that it, the extent in which he was assisting, assisting the Contras. Uh, he never really elaborated on that. He was very closed-mouthed about a lot of things that he did. Um, or maybe I just didn't ask any questions. Um, Richard and I had, you know, done a lot of things together. We've flown money from out to the Bahamas uh, together. And uh, one time in 83, he came to me and uh, we flew a load of grenades and um, some ship mines to Iliapango. Uh, okay, let me let me sort of go through that in greater detail. Had you ever flown guns anywhere before? On occasion. Okay, now where had you flown guns to? Uh, to Columbia. And in whose airplane did you fly guns to Columbia? Uh, George's, Morales. What did you do with the guns you flew in Columbia? Well, I just got there and offloaded them and, and, and loaded on the uh, contraband, the marijuana, or whatever, and uh, came back. Now, the guns that you flew came from where? You flew out of Florida? Uh, yes, sir. All, all the guns came out of Florida, uh, out of Opelika, right at George's office. What kind of guns, do you recall? Well, I'm not a gun expert, uh, Senator. Um, there were uh, AR-15s, uh, pistols, ammunition, that sort of thing. How would this be packaged for the flight? In, in their cases and in boxes and stuff like that. Uh, how many, and you could fly, what, about 2,000 pounds? or? Oh, I could. Uh, in those occasions going to Columbia, I never had quite that much. I, Anywhere from 500 to 800, maybe 1,000 pounds. So you flew guns down out of Florida. Did you have a permit? No. You know where the guns came from? No. You would load the guns on the plane, fly down to Columbia, drop off guns, pick up drugs. Is that accurate? Well, I didn't load the aircraft. Uh, 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 Hiro Plata would load it, and I would come to the aircraft, and it would be loaded. You know. What kind of aircraft was this? The Panther. Okay. You flew the Panther down, you landed at a strip in Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, and once the guns were out, was something else put in the plane? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, marijuana or uh, quaaludes. And you flew those back? Yes. To where? To Great, Great Harbor Key. And while you were engaged, uh, these flights were in what period of time? Those flights were during 1982, I would say. Shortly thereafter, Richard Healy invited you to go on a flight to Ilopango Air Force Base in El Salvador. Yes, that's correct. When was that? And uh, I think it was May of 83. Can you describe how that came about? Well, uh, George had uh, brought up uh, the George and company, I don't know how it all went, uh, six or eight uh, Brazilian registered DC-3s, OC-47s. And... Uh, uh, he sold them, and and you, they used a few of them, what have you. I wasn't involved in all of that, but uh, Richard and I had flown together a considerable amount, and we were close friends, and he asked me if I wanted to take a trip to uh, Iliopango. And I said, sure. I said, what does it pay? I mean, I was into getting paid for my work. And uh, he said, oh, I don't know, about 300000 I said, yeah, you give me two, and you take one, I'll go. He said, it's a deal. So I met him at Opalaka that, mo that morning, and uh, went through the aircraft with him. The aircraft was already loaded with uh, um, grenade launchers. I didn't look to see what it was. I mean, I later found out that's what it was, but... <clears throat> when you say it. you later found out, when did you find out? Well, when I got down there, we offloaded it. So you actually saw grenade launchers being offloaded? Yeah, M79s, about 40 of them. And this was in what kind of aircraft? Uh, DC-3. And how did you uh, manage to land flying from where you flew at Ilopango? Well, we, we left from uh, Opalaca and got into uh, Boca Chica, I'd say around noon or a little after noon. Boca Chica's a naval air station out in the Keys. And there were people there waiting for us. Now, is this a naval air station? Naval air station, yes. Open, closed? Well, I think it was kind of a reserve base at the time, uh, but there were uh, military aircraft on the ground. You landed there? Yes. And did you have uh, a flight plan clearance of any kind? No. And then where'd you go? 
Uh, we left uh, Boca Chica and uh, went to Iliapango. What did you load at the base at Boca Chica? Uh, ship mines. And I was given an uh, aluminum tube, had some maps in it, and a uh, manila envelope, as I recall, it had the name Chris on it. And I was instructed, uh, Richard was instructed, and I was standing there with him to deliver this uh, to Chris in Leopango. And that when we met there, we'd be led to the place called the Arrow Club, which is on, I recall, it's on the southwest side of the field. The Arrow Club mm -hmm. at the Ilopango base. Right. Okay, who met you at the Ilopango base? Well, a, a truck met us there and we, when, we, when we got out, and then there was a guy by the name of Chris that got the envelope and the uh, maps. And was the, Chris uh, El Salvadoran? No, he was an American. He was American. Did he identify himself to you? No, he didn't. Other than he was Chris. Um, did you have any conversation with him? He asked us if we wanted to go to the hotel, and uh, I talked to Richard about it, and we, uh, we said all we want is gas. <laughs> now, did you know who Chris worked for or who he represented? No, I didn't know, no. I had some assumptions, but I didn't know. Um, did Richard Healy tell you who he worked for? No. Your assumption was what? That it was uh, Department of Defense or CIA or something like that. What made you assume that? Well, after having been underground for so many years and working in the Bahamas and Colombia and, and, and in all out of different places and hanging out with George Morales and seeing all these things came down, it was just a normal thing to assume. What kind of truck was this? that picked up these uh, weapons? A large green military truck, as I recall, yeah. And they had to, uh, the ship mines were loaded forward between the grenade launchers. They had a difficult time stacking them in there and, and getting the netting around them and securing them. And, and so uh, they took them out, you know, by hand, scooted them down the aircraft and, and uh, out the door and loaded them in the truck. How many people were offloading? There were five or six guys there. Were they American or El Salvadorian? No, they were Spanish-speaking uh, El Salvadorians, I suppose. In uniform? Yes. And was this at an isolated part of the base? Mm, it was down past the terminal. It was pretty isolated. It was a military. It looked like it was all military there. Okay. You say your interest was in getting fuel and leaving. Well, that was my interest, yes. <laughs> Did you, in fact, do that? Uh, yes, we, we got fuel about 6 in the morning. And where did you go to? Uh, straight to... Uh, a little town in northern Colombia called Rio Hacha is just uh, east of uh, Santa Marta, about 40, 50 miles. What did you do in Rio Hacha? We landed and uh, fueled the aircraft, and we were, people were waiting for us. And what kind of people? Colombians. What was the purpose of that landing? Uh, we picked up a load of marijuana and uh, departed as soon as possible to uh, Great Harbor Key. That was all arranged. I mean, I knew I was, everything was going to come down before I went. How did you know everything was going to come down? Because Richard uh, gave me the flight plan. So, how much uh, marijuana did you load on board this airplane? I uh, understood later it was 6,000 pounds. So you fly... Whose airplane was it? Well, it was uh, George's airplane. Okay. Was this airplane used regularly in drug trafficking? So. Pardon? Was this airplane used in drug trafficking? Uh, the aircraft had, had had a sticker on it. I don't know if it was uh, Customs or, or DEA or even the FAA. It could have been an FAA sticker, but I do recall that they had, it had had a sticker on the aircraft. Uh, it was grounded for some reason at one time or another. You don't know. So somebody had to arrange to, to release the aircraft to, to go do what it did. How did you happen to notice that? Was that unusual to you? or? Well, that particular aircraft had some pretty good radios in it. Uh, of all the ones that he had, uh, that was the only one that had uh, decent radios in it. I do recall that much about it. Do you remember the kinds of radios? Uh, pardon? Do you remember the kinds of radios? Mm, I think one of them had a KR-85, which is a King. It's not the best King, but it uh, is a good ADF. and. Uh, and it had a couple of, uh, I don't know, it was narco, I think it were narco radios, the small aircraft radios, but they, they worked fine. Where did you notice the sticker? Uh, on the left side of the fuselage in the rear, past the uh, door. It was a cargo type uh, door, it had the double hinged door on it. Now, uh, 
Now, let's be precise about the period of time again, if we can. Do you recall when? This was 1983? 1983 in May. Do you May. remember what month? I, I'm pretty sure it was May. Now, subsequent to that, did you have occasion uh, to fly again for George Morales? Yes, I flew on different occasions for him, uh, miscellaneous things. I uh, made a few trips to Columbia for him. Uh, were those narcotics trips again? Yes. And this is during 83, 84? Uh, 83, yeah, and uh, I, didn't fl I, I don't think I flew for him in 84. Uh, I didn't run into him again until uh, July of 84. Did you, in fact, earn $200,000 for that flight you described to Ilopango? Uh, yes, I did. Uh -huh. Is that more than you would earn for normal uh, drug flights? Uh, usually a DC-3 load uh, pays 100000 Uh Yeah, considerably more. Now, after the flight with Richard Healy, uh, you were also at the same time flying your own cocaine flights. Is that accurate? Uh, I started right after that. So you were beginning to make even better money for yourself, correct? Uh, that's correct. I had uh, two partners. Um, my function was uh, handle the aircraft and, and, uh, and train the pilots. At that time, they didn't want me flying anymore. I mean, uh, so I had to uh, hire pilots. Who didn't want you flying? My partners. Why? Because I was uh, too valuable uh, otherwise. Now, did there come a time when you lost a flight? Uh, yes, April 84. How did that happen? Well, uh, the guy was caught on the ground. Where? Uh, the driver uh, was caught uh, in Glades uh, County. In Florida? Yes, sir. What were the circumstances of his being caught? He was trying to get out or come in? Well, he had the load in the uh, truck and he was driving out. Uh, I, I didn't know the guy. and. Uh, so I don't know all the circumstances on that. All I know is I got home at about 1 o'clock in the morning. I got a phone call, and they say, we lost the load. And uh, so I just I packed my bags and locked my doors and left. Because I didn't know what the situation or circumstances were. were uh, uh, none of my people got busted. I mean, the pilots got away, and we secured the aircraft. Right, and at this point, you decided that you were going to retire for the second time. Uh, yes, sir. Because? Well, because I uh, didn't want to work anymore. It was too risky. Okay. Now, we're going to come back. We're going to take a brief recess and come back and talk about the George Morales and Costa Rica trips. Uh, after the recess, we'll take a 15-minute recess. Stand in recess 15 minutes. The Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Terrorism, Narcotics, and International Operations will resume testimony in just a few minutes. Hearing will come back to order. Um, counsel, I neglected to do this at the early part, and I apologize, not because I wanted to ignore you, but would you just identify yourself for the uh, record? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Sheldon Yavitz. I'm from Miami, Florida. I'm attorney hey. for Mr. Betzner. And you've been representing him for some time, is that Yes, accurate? since 19... Uh, 84. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, now, Mr. Betzner, you said uh, just before the break that there came a time when you lost a flight and uh, the result was that you got a little uh, nervous about the operation and you essentially retired for the second time from the business. Is that accurate? That's accurate, sir. Where did you go to during the second retirement? I went to Hawaii. How long were you there for? I stayed there until July. Of what year? Of 84. Okay. And at some time, did George Morales call you? Uh, yes, he did. What did he call you for? Can you pull the mic a little bit close to you there? Just, uh, I don't know if you can... Uh, he told me he need, had something for me to do that was very important. Did he explain to you what it was? As best he could over the telephone. We were very cautious about the phone. He said if I would come back that he could, I could be very beneficial in helping him uh, get out from under his indictment. Okay, now this time you knew that George Morales was indicted. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. And George specifically said you could help me get out from under my indictment? Right. right. Okay. So did you fly back to Florida? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And what did you do when you got to Florida? 
I met with George and uh, he gave me the rundown on the, the whole thing. Uh, what did George say to you about the whole thing? Uh, he said that he had made a deal with the uh, CIA uh, to uh, supply them with uh, money and with assistance and that he uh, wanted me to fly some uh, guns and uh, ammunition and stuff like that uh, down to the Contras and, um, and bring uh, some contraband back. Now you're, you're absolutely positive about this. This is what George Morales said to you. Uh, yes, he gave me the general rundown that, that this is what was happening, yes. What was your reaction to that? I said, well, give me the details. Uh, you know, what is it you need done? I, I, I didn't really, like, I didn't want to do it. Uh, but uh, I always uh, loved and respected George because he took me in and he trusted me when I was like an orphan, you know. <laughs> and uh, so one good turn does another. And uh, loyalty is something that... Uh, that we all learned to respect in our lives and, and um, so <clears throat> he gave me the rundown of the situation it didn't seem to be too difficult and uh, seemed to be covered and and um, I always took George for his word I mean and many times I was amazed at some of the things that he said would uh, take place that actually took place and so over the years and through experiences uh, where you risk your life uh, in other people's hands you eventually learn to trust people and especially when you're handling large sums of money and you know in the millions of dollars and they're transacted and held in a parking lot and um, it's not like uh, the business world whereby you have to have contracts and, and then you still might get uh, taken advantage of I mean our business was a business uh, where your word is your bond and so not to elaborate too much he gave me the rundown on what he wanted done and um, it seemed pretty simple to me and so I agreed to do it. Was this the first time that you'd heard mention of uh, CIA or Contras from George? Uh, yes, uh, it wasn't something that was generally carried on in conversation or you sit around the office and talk about. Um, I would say um, I knew that George had, had connections in the past. I, I never had uh, talked to him about it. Uh, I, I knew, I can't say that I knew, I suspected that he had some connections with uh, some government officials at time to time. And uh, did you then agree to do this flight? Yes, sir. Okay. When did this flight take place? I think in July. It was July of uh, 84. Sometime summer, late summer? Yeah, mid-summer. Uh, what kind of airplane did you use? Uh, the first time was a Cessna and the second time was a, a Panther. And where did the flight originate from? The first one was out of Fort Lauderdale. What was uh, loaded into that flight? Uh, that particular flight had an M60 machine gun, um, other M16 guns, uh, as, as I recall, I didn't see any like any new packaging. It was uh, looked like uh, it was uh, put together. I mean, it was packaged packaged neatly, but it wasn't uh, like you know right from the factory type stuff. And this is in what kind of airplane? A Cessna 402B. Now, if this was packaged, how did you know what was in the packages? Because I had to go in the back door and climb over the stuff. Uh, it didn't have a pilot's door in the front of the aircraft. You knew, identified it by the packages, or you actually saw what was Well, there? when I offloaded it, I got to see most of what was there. There was some C4 explosive, you know, plastic explosive. This was loaded at the Fort Lauderdale, Florida airport? That's where I picked up the aircraft. During the daytime? No, I, I left about midnight. Uh, who left with you? Uh, Tito. Who is Tito? Uh, he had flown with me several different times in the past when I worked for George. He was a Colombian uh, young fellow uh, who was a trustee of George. You flew from Fort Lauderdale. Did you have a permit for those weapons that you left the country with? Uh, no, sir. Of course not. You had no paperwork? No. You took those weapons and flew to where? I flew to Costa Rica to the ranch of uh, one Mr. John Hull. 
Did you know who John Hull was? Not until I met him at, the, uh, at his airport. Had you ever met him previously? No, I haven't. Okay, can you uh, just take a moment to walk over to the map and identify the exact location that you landed at on this first flight in Costa Rica? Oh, yes, sir. Is that uh, an identified strip on that flight map? Why don't you come back uh, to the microphone so you can speak and identify that? The place that you just identified is actually an identified strip on that map which says what? John Hull. That's a small circle showing an airstrip. Is oh, that yes, accurate? Sir. Yes, sir. That's part of his ranch? Uh, it's on his ranch. It's right on the river. Had you ever been there before? No, sir, I haven't. Okay, how did you, and uh, that was where you were instructed to land? Yes. Okay, you left at midnight. What time did you arrive there? Well, I would say probably 7 in the morning when I uh, neared the coast of uh, Costa Rica. After I picked up the, uh, the VOR out of San Jose, um, I was about 8,000 feet, and the sun was coming up. And so I descended down. There was a, s a slight overcast, uh, well, I'd say broken to scattered, about uh, 1,500 feet. I stayed above that until uh, I lost the VOR over the mountains from San Jose. And then I went to my chart that I had uh, of that area and um, went directly to the strip by uh, following landmarks. When I was about 10 minutes out, I, I called them on a frequency that I had, and uh, they replied, and uh, so I went to that strip. And Can you describe the strip to us? Well, when I, when I entered uh, the pattern to go into the strip, I flew uh, south of uh, the strip over a bridge, which was one of my landmarks. And there, there's a uh, bend in the river, two sharp bends in the river, actually, I circled uh, west uh, of the airstrip when I, when I first saw it over a pasture uh, and I made a right hand pattern and uh, landed in a strip. Uh, his strip's a little over 3,000 feet long with a what is known as a dog leg uh, that kind of curves to the west on the uh, north end uh, and there's some bushes on that end of the strip. Uh, the strip runs right along the river. The north end is right on the river. The middle of the strip is a probably 100 yards or so from the river, kind of a big sandbar that extends down to the river and several small trees. Uh, there's a, a road that runs down the center of the strip. Well, actually it's over to, on the west side. A fence on the west side, as I recall. Uh, I landed, a taxi to the end. <coughs> uh, he was there. What do you say, he? Uh, John Hall and uh, uh, some blonde-headed guy, a younger fellow, and uh, two uh, Latins. Were there any vehicles around? Uh, as I recall, there was a, a Japanese uh, Datsun truck or something like that with a funny thing on the back of it, and uh, there was a, uh, a big truck that we offloaded the uh, weapons into, you know, like a, a ton and a half truck or something. But when you got out of the aircraft and stopped the engines, uh, did, uh, did he identify himself to you? How did you know yes, who he was? Yes, I walked up to him, uh, shook his hand, he introduced himself. I introduced myself. Uh, what did he look like? He was an older guy, about 60, 65, um, bald-headed. Uh, I think he had blue eyes. Uh, about 200 pounds, I guess. Uh, maybe a little, about 200 pounds. And um, about my height, maybe a little bit shorter. And uh, what much can I say about the guy? You know. Okay. I've identified his pictures. And Did you have a conversation? Oh, yes, we talked about, he said he was from Indiana, um, that he'd been down there for a few years, 10 or 15 years, something like that. Did you help offload the weapons? No, I did not. I stood there while they were being offloaded, but I didn't have to. These other guys uh, did it. I just stood there, you know, protect the aircraft and watch the aircraft. That was my... You saw them being offloaded? Yes. How long did that operation take? Oh, about an, hour, about an hour and a half. We didn't get in a real big hurry. We had to uh, 
he had uh, the gas was there in barrels. He said he had a truck, but it had a, some of the kind of fuel on it, so we all pumped out of the barrels. Had a nice pump and filter and, and the works. So I fueled up. I only used about 230 gallons or something like that going down there. Did you get introduced to the blonde-haired person? No, I did not. Okay. After the guns were unloaded, was something loaded into the airplane? Uh, yes, I loaded about 17 duffel bags and uh, five or six uh, two-foot square boxes in the aircraft. And what was in the duffel bags? Coke. Cocaine. And in the boxes? Cocaine. Okay. Was John Hull there while you loaded it in? Yes, he was. Did uh, he or anybody uh, explain to you what you were loading, or did you know? I knew. How did you know? Because I was told before I was I left that I would be bringing coke back. I mean, you know, George wouldn't send me out to. Uh, I mean, I knew what the risk involved and what was involved before I took the job. How much were you getting paid for that job? Well, we didn't really discuss it. I mean, we went into it, and and George says, "Well, I'm I'm doing it for nothing, really." He says, "I'm." just doing it for nothing and, and you're the only pilot that I know that can bring it all the way back in and uh, you know and uh, he said if you have any problems when you come back in there'll be somebody uh, to cover for you. I said don't worry I won't have any problems and he said well there'll be no problems that everything's covered and you won't have any problems. What do, you, what do you mean everything is covered or there'll be somebody there to cover for you? Well you know if the customs uh, or DEA followed me and uh, when I landed the aircraft uh, I wouldn't have any problems. I mean, I would, they wouldn't bother me. Had he ever said anything like that to you before? No. Had that been true of any of your other flights as a drug smuggler? No. Were you surprised by it? Did you ask him what he meant? No, actually I wasn't surprised by it because I knew that, uh, that George was uh, uh, anti-communist uh, as are most Colombians. Uh, so the cartel and people like that are, are definitely uh, anti-communist to, I don't suppose their world would function too well in a communist world. It's strictly a, a, a capitalist movement, uh, this drug business. So, <clears throat> and uh, George has never lied to me. George is the kind of guy, if he tells you the sun's not coming up tomorrow, you can uh, place your bet on it, you know. Now, with respect to the cartel that you just mentioned, did you have occasion to meet Barry Seal? You know who I, Barry I met him Seal on, is? On, on several different occasions. Uh, you know, he was an affable guy, amiable guy, uh, but I felt like uh, some of the people that he knew that uh, he was playing both sides and I had been t and told that, so when I'd see him coming, I'd usually go the other way. Where did you first meet Barry Seal? The first time I met him was in Nassau. And you meet him subsequently? Yes, I ran into him one time in Miami and another time uh, at, in, up in Pennsylvania. Where in Pennsylvania? In Air America. And where do, you say he played both sides. What was your understanding of what Barry Seal was involved in? Uh, that uh, he was uh, with the, involved with the CIA, RDEA, but uh, CIA was the, the indication that I got. And did you come at some point to, uh, uh, you mentioned something about the cartel and its support. Did you learn anything from your friends in the Cuban community or elsewhere about cartel uh, support of the Contras? Oh, yes, uh, this, uh, a lot of the Cubans that, that I worked with uh, were uh, Mariel and a lot of them were uh, Bay of Pigs type people, you know, uh, went a long ways back and they were fervent uh, anti-communist. Uh, that's what we're, that they were into. And of course the ones that I knew were smugglers. Um, those are the only people that I knew. I didn't know anybody outside uh, that type of, those type of people. And were those smugglers at that time assisting in any way that you knew of? Uh, only by, uh, I can surmise, but nothing that I know okay. of that I actually uh, witnessed, no. Nothing that you saw? No, sir. But things you heard? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, now, how long did it take to load the flight with the cocaine? Ten minutes. Then what did you do? I walked around the aircraft, uh, surmised, looked at his airstrip, uh, 
I had doubts about his uh, strip, so we, after we gassed and loaded the aircraft, uh, I, uh, we pushed the aircraft back. Uh, actually, tied it, tied a rope on the back of it, as I recall now, and, and we pushed it back to the uh, road. Uh, in the center of the strip, as you look directly down the strip, was a building. So I had to go over west of the building, and the grass uh, hadn't been mowed very well there. It was kind of uh, tall. And, but anyway, I backed up as far as I could and, uh, and then ran the engine up, ran, ran the engines up. Had an extra 75, 80 yards there, you know. And I uh, got a pretty good roll and uh, put the flaps down about halfway down the strip. Uh, pulled the aircraft off the ground. Just as it broke ground, I pulled the gear up and, you know, I made it all right. And uh, turned across the river and uh, headed out. And but so it wasn't that... It was kind of hairy. You flew back to where? Uh, I was coming back to, uh, supposed to come back in the Fort Lauderdale Executive. And uh, I got cold feet. I uh, started thinking about it. So when I got back... Well, why'd uh, you get cold feet? Well, I just never had, I was always been very cautious and uh, I never had gone back into an airport uh, in the United States uh, to a controlled field. I always landed in the middle of fields in the middle of the night with uh, night vision goggles on all parameters and and everything was covered and police were paid off and everything was you know together and uh, this this was a little bit out of my uh, this was I, sort of bold daylight supposedly cleared yeah. to land and right. that's what George had informed you right well yeah but uh, you got cold feet notwithstanding that right so I have my own operation in Lakeland I had a hangar there so uh, I had enough fuel when I got back, so I just went on to Lakeland and uh, offloaded the, uh, their Coke in my van and uh, had Tito drive it back to Miami. And I kept 20 kilos for my, my, my part. Subsequent to that, did George Morales ask you to do anything else for him? In, in what regard, Senator? I mean, after that? After that flight? Yes, uh, a week or ten days later or so, I did another one. And uh, this time I used the Panther. After explaining to George, uh, the 402 wasn't the machine for that job, and especially out of that strip, and that um, if that guy was going to be in that kind of business, he needs to have a better strip. And I had uh, um, uh, coordinates for these strips, and uh, also I had a map with uh, a circle around it, and. The alternate, when I went down the first time, was Las Llanas. And um, I hadn't seen the strip, but I knew Is Las Llanas a strip right near the John Hall strip? Well, probably 10, or 10 miles or so away. Maybe a little further, a little I, less. Do you know how to spell Las Llanas? L-L-A-N-O-S. You know, and uh, it's a lowland area uh, near, as I found out now, it's the Voice of America Towers. It's about... Uh, I'd say three quarters of a mile from the towers east, you know, give or take a quarter mile or so. Now, let's, let's go back to the beginning here. What airport did you leave from this time? I left from Opalaka. Opalaka Airport. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Where was the plane loaded? It was loaded right in the aviation activities, uh, right, in, right there in his, in his hangar, you know. At, uh, in George Morales' hangar? Right. When I got there, it was uh, pulled outside and... Uh, it was uh, loaded to the ceiling. That, that was a good load. Uh, it had a pilot's door on it, so I just got in it. Tito went with me again, and we departed about 11, 30, 12 o'clock that night. And what was this load? Uh, about the same configuration, um, small arms. No ammunition I know of. Uh, just a lot of small arms, you know. Again, did you have any permit or any paperwork for that? I think there were some mines. I think there were some mines. You have to clear that was George, but I believe there were some uh, landmines or something there, if I recall. And you, uh, again, the answer on the paperwork, no permits, no permissions. No, sir, no permits, no permission. Did George say anything again this time about where you should land and where you should return to? Uh, yeah, I think he did. He, he re I, I was supposed to come right back to uh, Opalaka and just taxi up to the uh, hangar, no problem. Did you then fly down to John Hall's ranch? 
Uh, I didn't go to John Hall's home place. I went to this other strip called La, La Shaughness, and when I got there, I called, and, uh, and that's where they were. They were there. They, they being who? John Hall. And who else? And uh, two Latins, just John Hall and two Latins. As I recall, there was a pickup truck setting up the road. I mean, this is the first time I brought that up, but I saw a truck sitting up the road there. I don't, I don't know who was in it, but there was a truck sitting up the road about it. It's around the strip just north. At what time of day did you arrive this time? I got there early in the morning at the same time. What did this strip look like? Uh, this strip was uh, in the middle of uh, a lowland area. There were no trees. There were uh, tropical trees across the road on the on the uh, south end of the strip. I believe the strip laid uh, southwest, uh, northeast uh, to the southeast of the strip were some low-lying hills and uh, there was four towers uh, directly west of the strip uh, there was a road that runs south of the strip uh, around uh, to the north and it's uh, red it looks like clay or something uh, there were drainage ditches uh, cut perpendicular to the airstrip on both sides uh, as I said before, there are no trees around that I can recall. Uh, you said you recalled some towers? Yes, sir. Uh, there were towers uh, west where, of there. Where were the towers? How far away? I'd say about three quarters of a mile. What kind of, what, what sort of towers? Very tall uh, towers, maybe two or three hundred feet tall. How many? Four of them. Do you know what they were? They're Voice of America. When you landed, did you again have a discussion with Mr. John Hall? Yeah, just, hi, how you doing? Did you supervise the offloading? Uh, no, again, I stood there while it was offloaded. Uh, Did John I, Hull supervise the offloading? No, he just stood back and they took care of everything. The two Latins? Right. Okay. And where were the, uh, did you load anything into the plane after that? Uh, yes, I loaded cocaine in the plane with the same t configuration, except this time there wasn't any boxes. It was all in the duffel bags. How many duffel bags? I would say probably 17 or 15, 17. Each of them held about 30 kilos. I, I estimated uh, around 500 kilos. And when, uh, when you landed, where, was the, uh, where were the duffel bags at the time you were doing the offloading? They were in the truck. They had a, had a different truck with a, uh, a fueling truck there. With, uh, had a compartment in it, and that's where the, most of the bags were. Who loaded the uh, bags into the plane? Uh, they were handed to me, and I stacked them. So you could load them correctly? Yes, sir. And again, uh, the total load was how much? Uh, approximately 500 kilos. Value of those 500 kilos wholesale at that time? Well, wholesale uh, goes all in different levels. Uh, some people say it was 20,000, and other people were wholesaling for 35,000. It depends on who and where. At a kilo? Yeah. Per kilo? Yes, sir. And you had 500 kilos? Yes, sir. So a low end of 20,000, high end of 35,000 right. at that point in time? At that point, yes. Okay. Do you know where that cocaine uh, came from? No, I wouldn't know precisely where it came from, but it was uh, like all the cocaine I've, I've picked up in Colombia. It was packaged the same way. Subsequent to your flight, once you'd gotten back, did you hear something about where that cocaine had come from or one of the loads that you had picked up from John Hull's ranch? I, I don't understand why you're if, uh, getting at there, Senator. Did you learn anything about the uh, about what might have taken place uh, with respect to Mr. Hull and one of those cocaine loads? Oh, are you talking about uh, the kidnapping and stuff? That uh, I'm, I'm asking you if you I, did. I, hear I had heard something about that, but I heard about that after, long after that I uh, I did these two loads. With how Mr. long? How long after? Um, since I've been arrested, you know, since I ran into Georgia, after all this came out, that's when I found out about it. Just for the record, because there are others who have uh, testified to this, I'd like to know what it was that you heard. I just heard that, uh, that uh, John Hall had uh, ripped off some coke off of a boat or something, or a plane or something that sunk, and, and um, the people knew he had it. And uh, they kidnapped one of his kids in order to get it back or something. That's basically, I don't know all the details. I mean, it was just in passing conversation. Do you know where you had that passing conversation? 
I'm not sure. It must have been down at MCC. It's been a while. The record should so show that. Uh, record should show that the same uh, story has been uh, told by both Jose Blandon and uh, and Mr. Floyd Carlton, who was one of General Noriega's pilots, who testified to it in some detail to what took place. Uh, do you know Floyd Carlton? Uh, no, sir, I don't. I know of him. But you've never met him? Not that I recall. No, I've seen his picture. I don't think so. Let me, uh, let me at this point in time introduce into the record uh, this is an unclassified, now unclassified uh, letter from the Department of the Treasury, the U.S. Customs Service, uh, a letter from uh, Rochelle Lopez. Uh, to Mr. Ralph Martin, Department of Justice, Public Integrity Attorney. Uh, in 1986, my staff released a report uh, in which many of the details, uh, though some of them sketchy, but many of the details of the story we are hearing today, as well as other allegations, were laid out and set forth uh, in considerable detail. Uh, the majority of those allegations, perhaps 95 percent of them, have now been proven and carried out uh, through the Iran-Contra Committee select uh, investigation. Uh, in addition to the testimony before this committee over the course of the last months. However, uh, when that report was sent down there prior to the Iran-Contra news uh, being made public, uh, a check was run on our report, and in the letter it says, as explained, the data provided in Senator Kerry's report was cross-checked with the criminal indices of the Treasury Enforcement Communications System and headquarters files. In addition, customs officers of enforcement in Miami and Atlanta were contacted. For your information, TECS, which is the Enforcement Communications System records, are indexed by name and other identifying data. TECS query of the names furnished, that is in uh, our report, resulted in 21 matches. There were, however, numerous instances in which matches could not be refined as they were too many records in the universe. For example, the name John Hull resulted in 293 possible matches. Consequently, without further identifying data, we will not be able to determine if a record exists for some of the persons named. Uh, subsequent to this, I believe the letter, this is right. uh, subsequent uh, to learning that Mr. Hull's name uh, had turned up 293 times, uh, this was classified. And no further investigation was made. Mr. Hull was continued to permit uh, to uh, operate with impunity. Uh, in fact, to the point that he filed false affidavits with the United States Attorney concerning this senator and our investigation uh, while continuing uh, to work uh, with agencies of the United States government. Uh, Mr. Hull has been under subpoena by this committee for, I think, uh, eight months. Uh, and uh, he continues to avoid uh, presenting himself to this committee. So many questions are, are raised by the entire uh, uh, set of circumstances surrounding Mr. Hull's activities in the region, as well as uh, in these uh, events which have been set forward here. And I personally uh, am disturbed by the fact uh, that uh, these allegations have sat out there for as long as they have with as little law enforcement follow-up and uh, investigative effort, and enough said on that. Mr. Betzner, let me come back uh, to this second flight. You loaded with narcotics, um, and you flew back to the United States, correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Was that your last drug flight? Uh, it's the last one I did for George. 
Did you make any money off that flight? Uh, yes, I made about 360000 You say it's the last flight you did for George. Uh, that's correct. Did you do some more flights for yourself? Uh, yes, I left and uh, went back to Hawaii. And um, I had met this lady and had fallen in love and and uh, we were going to be married. And, and uh, we were back in Hawaii and I had another friend call me and uh, they made me an offer and I couldn't refuse it. And so I, that's, so I was subsequently uh, arrested and uh, busted. Okay, and this, this next offer was another drug flight? Uh, yes. Okay, from where to where? Uh, from uh, Columbia to Lake City, Florida. What kind of aircraft? A Panther. Now, this flight took place when? Uh, November 13th and 14th of 84. And you were arrested when? At that time, the 14th. At the airport? Uh, no, I got away from the airport, but I was subsequently uh, apprehended uh, in the city and, uh, and incarcerated. And you were indicted for? For um, four counts in conspiracy to import cocaine. That is the sentence that you're now serving? Uh, yes, sir. I received 15 years uh, for that, plus 10 years special parole. And uh, then later went back to Miami. Um, when I got there, uh, I pleaded guilty to uh, the bond jumping and the case that I had in Miami that was then at about 10 years old and uh, received a consecutive sentence uh, on top of my uh, 15. So your total sentence you're serving now is what? 27 years and two months. And you did, in fact, marry this woman that you met? Yes, I did. And by previous marriage, you have uh, kids, do you not? Uh, yes, sir. I have five children. Now, you still own a farm in Arkansas? No, sir, I don't. Okay. And there was a period of time in your life when you were in Arkansas uh, as a crop duster that you were involved in a lot of activities. Isn't that accurate? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Supported uh, candidates for office, campaigns? Yeah, I w uh, was, you know, was active in my community and uh, was kids I grew up with and played ball with and against and I knew them all my life. Uh, I was president of JC's. Uh, we had a nice JC club in those days. Uh, I was a county coordinator for our senator, uh, Dale Bumpers, at the time. Uh, I was also on the executive committee of the Young Democrat Club and I was a uh, and when Rockefeller ran, I was in college, I was in, on the executive committee of the Republican Party. And uh, <clears throat> I was always interested in, in civic uh, things, you know, a good citizen. As a matter of fact, my political views in those days were somewhere to the right of the John Birch Society, as were most of my friends in those days. Now, uh, Mr. Betzner, uh, let me come back to a couple things I'd like to get out. Uh, and let me just offer you the opportunity here, uh, because I, you know, what you've said is very important testimony, and it's very significant. And obviously, uh, uh, you've pointed some heavy fingers in a few directions. Is there anything in here that's that's shaded? Something you want to change? Anything you feel ought to be uh, restated, or anything that you somehow are uncomfortable with, having said it? Mm, no, sir, none whatsoever. I wish I had been more, I wish I would have been in a situation where I could have kept notes and times and dates and places and, you know, uh, I've uh, often uh, wished I could have done that, but in my business I was not able to do that. The, uh, one of the things I'd like to get at slightly outside of the other subject is the whole notion of, of uh, efforts to try to uh, uh, One or two other questions, if I can. Um, do you have current feelings about what's happening in Central America? Do you have any political feelings about the war? Well, Senator, I, I, somewhere within inside of me, I have a, a deep appreciation of, uh, of my country. Um, its history, uh, 
the Constitution and what it stands for uh, <clears throat> still move my soul considerably. Um, after when you're standing on one side of the fence looking at, at, at a situation, it looks one way, and you go on the other side and you look at it, it looks another way. So do I have any feelings about it? Um, I think that with the proper leadership and, um, and the genuine caring and with some common sense, uh, all of these things in Central and South America could have been avoided a long time ago. After all, they are, you know, uh, connected to us. And uh, so I am not I mean, a policymaker and I'm not a politician. I understand and, that. I'm not trying to ask you to go into that, but just in a, in a short sort of answer, were you personally supportive of the Contras? Do you dislike the Sandinistas? Did you feel like you were taking sides or was it irrelevant to you? Well, I was sympathetic for the Contras, yes. Now, um, one last area I just want to ask you about. The question of evasive tactics, flying all these flights, 1983-84, we're conscious of the drug problem in this country, we're spending money on enforcement and interdiction. Uh, you seem to fly in and out with fair impunity. Yes. How, how were you able to do that? Well, I made it a science. Uh, I had uh, knowledge and background on electronics and uh, electronic countermeasures, which means uh, knowing how, know the fingerprints of radar, how radar works, and that sort of thing. And so I spent time in my aircraft and, uh, and with my detecting devices. I even built uh, radar detectors and uh, sold them. <laughs> and uh, we would, uh, I would go up and down the coast. I wasn't too concerned about the east coast of Florida. It was pretty easy. But you had to come through an array, a net of uh, surveillance that uh, somewhere along the line you might be detected and, 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 and followed in. So if you really wanted to come in uh, incognito at any time of the day, really, uh, all you needed to do was uh, be able to fly below the horizon under the radar, come up into the blind spot between the radars, and then um, as you get in near shore, uh, always try to be uh, ha having a heading that is southerly instead of coming uh, from the from the south, uh, be coming from the north, and you just penetrate. Uh, I had my aircraft painted uh, dark green, and the windows were uh, tinted, so you couldn't see in the aircraft. And I had tape numbers. I just take the numbers off, and uh, I tried to come in about 30 minutes before dark, uh, and I was un unable to do that by having a, an Omega system on my aircraft uh, or a Loran. But Omega was really nice. I could pinpoint myself within 50 feet anywhere on the earth and uh, fly accordingly. <clears throat> and so uh, it was very simple to do. Um, I have uh, one of my first flights. I came in on the East Coast and uh, just to test my theory. And uh, I had the good fortune of uh, picking up uh, the uh, customs, um, uh, what they call the citation with the infrared device on it. And uh, I don't know if the AWACS was tracking or not. Uh, I think it was. And then I had two aircraft, one on each wingtip, um, escort me in from uh, east of Andros. They picked me up uh, coming through the pass, uh, the windward pass down over Haiti. And uh, I just came in, had my computer set. I just came in about 30 minutes after sundown over right at Miami Beach and, uh, and lost them. I did it a couple of times. How, how'd you lose them? That particular time, I, I came in, went between the condominiums, and uh, uh, flew down uh, the inland waterway there. It's very dark. Um, listened to them on a scanner, what, what they were doing. And uh, I wasn't too sure about the AWACS, so I went on out to the international airport. And as I said, yeah, my aircraft was dark green. Uh, uh, I fell up under uh, an aircraft that was on the ILS. He was about 800 feet or so. I just pulled up under him for the fun of it and uh, followed him down the runway. When he landed, I just pulled up over him and uh, flew down the runway and <laughs> buzzed the tower and, and went over to the beach and flew on up north, you know. Uh, no big deal. Was there an occasion that AWACS did pick you up? Uh, yes, uh, on my last trip, they tracked me. Uh, that's when I knew someone had um, 
probably uh, had an informer somewhere. I mean, I, I suspected it at that moment. <clears throat> when I left uh, Columbia, I was being, uh, I was on uh, track, being tracked by AWACS. And so I just uh, went on and flew to Haiti and then I went down over Haiti and went through the valleys and over by Cape Haitian. And then uh, I flew on the water through a thunderstorm out to Great Inagua and I stayed east of the islands about 20 foot off the water below the cliffs uh, all the way up through the chain of the islands and uh, I listened to them on my scanner and uh, I, uh, they lost me and uh, they didn't pick me up and I later found out uh, the informant in my case was uh, Enrique uh, Lopez or Henry Lopez. You were arrested through an informant operation? Yeah, my old friend Henry Lopez was the informant and uh, as a matter of fact, he still owes me a million dollars. Maybe that was why he informed on me. <laughs> but uh, uh, he and Jairo Plata. <clears throat> so uh, uh, he knew that there were supposed to be 500 kilos on the plane, and, uh, he, and uh, he wondered why there was only uh, 300 pounds. So anyway, uh, he was the one that did it, and uh, here I am. Are there occasions you've come to know the informant world and the smuggler world, obviously, both of them very well. Do you know of occasions where informants uh, are working both sides while informing? Uh, yes, I know of uh, several, uh, maybe five different groups that are involved. Uh, I can't give you exact specifics on it. Uh, maybe. Um if we had a lot of time, perhaps, <clears throat> but uh, I know of one specific group uh, that uh, I had worked with, and that's uh, uh, Henry Lopez. Henry Lopez has been smuggling since, as I, I now understand, he was uh, working with them in 81, uh, since Kojak went to work for them. Um, but I didn't know at the time I was working with him that he was an informant. Uh, and George always said he was, but George was, we all have our paranoias. And uh, One or two final questions. Uh, as we try to deal with this issue of the drug war and we're trying to allocate money and decide where it goes and how to do it, um, obviously one of the things people keep looking at is, is a multi-front effort, enforcement, interdiction, education, and so forth. Um, you obviously have a certain disdain for the notion that uh, interdiction is going to be very effective. Can it be more effective than it is? Uh, is it necessary that people always work through as easily as you did? Oh, yes, sir. I, I think that uh, the human mind is a very ingenious thing, as you know. Uh, and uh, we have, if you count Hawaii and Alaska, we have over 20,000 miles of uh, a parameter, you know, uh, almost the circumference of the earth <laughs> to enter. An, and, uh, and the profits that are, are in this is very, are enormous. And, and there are people uh, who don't want to stop the drug trade. Uh, obviously, we can see that there's a there's a merging at the top uh, with the underworld, and uh, there's billions and billions of dollars being made here. And this is not something new, as history tells us. It's been going on since the Opium Wars. Uh, to me, it's the 21st century. Uh, I'm just talking from my own experience. I'm not talking from uh, what somebody said. Uh, frankly, uh, I'm alive, and I, I tried about everything. Uh, and uh, I'm fortunate to have because I'm able to explain to my children and uh, I'll never have a problem with my kids in those areas. Uh, so I think the name of the game is um, take the profit out of it, uh, legalize it, uh, license people, being that we live in a controlled society. We do and we're all different. Uh, make people buy a license and if they're caught with it without a license and without going to school and without being educated then uh, then find them or do whatever we, punishment is necessary to those people. Uh, if we bust, uh, arrest and incarcerate four million people and we give each one of them ten years, which is about happened, what's about, just about happened in the last twenty years for drugs, uh, and, and that's forty million years and say an average life expectancy in the twenty-first century is eighty years, divide that into four million and we have five hundred thousand lifetimes wasted. You know, and for what? I want to uh, thank you for sharing the experiences that you had with us, and I particularly want to thank you being willing to obviously take the risk which is involved with this and uh, let this committee know um, of what's happened. 
uh, and uh, I just want you to know that the subpoena which you're currently under will uh, continue to uh, be in effect until such uh, time as the committee decides it doesn't need you further with respect to this. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to take a 10-minute recess, and when we come back, we're going to proceed to uh, go with the videotapes of three uh, Nicaraguan exiles in Costa Rica uh, who will testify further to some of the things that Mr. Betzner has discussed and to uh, their involvement uh, in this particular sequence. Uh, so we stand in recess for 10 minutes. order. Let me remind uh, people that the evidence here with respect to narcotics and the private aid network or the Contras is cumulative and that what we have heard here this morning is not uh, the beginning. Uh, previously this committee has heard testimony from General Paul Gorman the United States Army Southern Commander at one period of time who said in his testimony quote there were fairly sizable marijuana operations on the southern front of Nicaragua some involving the Contras some not uh, Mr. Gorman noted that if one wants to organize an armed resistance or an armed undertaking for any purpose the easy place uh, to get the money and the easier places to get the guns are in the drug world that was by way of introduction to the problem. Uh, we have had testimony from Jose Blandon in the course of his testimony on Noriega. And Mr. Blandon testified uh, to the shipment of cocaine from the, quote, Cali cartel that was diverted to the farm of John Hull. Uh, and uh, we've heard further uh, testimony regarding uh, that uh, here this morning. Uh, Mr. Blandone also testified that Sebastian Gonzalez, who was a Contra working with Eden Pastora on the Southern Front, became a drug smuggler. In addition, we heard from Noriega's former pilot, Floyd Carlton, who is now convicted on federal drug charges. He is in the witness federal protection program, and he uh, uh, testified to uh, Alfredo Caballero's involvement in helping the Contras and narcotics trafficking. Uh, he also confirmed the Cali cartel story with respect to uh, Mr. John Hull. In addition, we've heard from Ramon Milian Rodriguez uh, in considerable detail about his involvement with Mr. George uh, uh, Morales, with his uh, uh, setting up uh, the laundering of money and so forth. Uh, there is other evidence in addition to that, but I simply want uh, the record to show the cumulative aspects of what uh, has been building here. At this point in time, we're going to look at three videotaped uh, depositions, and we're only going to see a portion of them. On October 30th of last year, I traveled to Costa Rica with members of my personal staff and, and the Foreign Relations Committee staff, including Jack Blum, special counsel to the committee. On Saturday, the 31st of October, we conducted depositions of three Nicaraguans living in exile, Octaviano Cesar, Marcus Aguado and Carol Prado. These three individuals were all members of ARDE, the Contra Force commanded by Aidan Pastora that operated in the southern uh, part of Nicaragua from 1982 to 1986. Uh, Cesar, Octaviano Cesar, is the brother of Alfredo Cesar who is one of the current seven men uh, directorship of the main Contra organization. We videoed uh, those depositions, each of which was about three hours long. The depositions were given under oath. Each person discussed a wide range of issues, ranging from the funding of our day to weapons shipments to drug trafficking. Cesar, Aguado, and Prado will all corroborate certain portions of testimony that you have heard thus far. Uh, these are, as I said, edited uh, segments. Uh, the story that they tell is a very complicated one, as some have learned that all of this is uh, complicated. We've tried to simplify it as much as possible by dividing the video into four segments, each segment approximately 10 minutes long. After each segment, I'll give a brief narration, which I hope clarifies the chain of events as they unfold. 
<clears throat> while these tapes do tell a clear story uh, that documents uh, some of the allegations made, uh, there are some contradictions. Uh, for example, each of the witnesses denied personally smuggling narcotics, and two out of the three point their fingers at one of the other as a smuggler. Uh, we will be making copies of this edited uh, videotape available to broadcast media after the hearing. And in addition, the full nine hours of video deposition will be made available for anybody uh, who wishes uh, to see them. Uh, my staff has tried to create uh, a tape that shows the contradictions as well as uh, the other portions uh, so that these are balanced. And uh, in the first segment, you will simply be introduced to the individuals and learn what their role was in the Southern Front organization. If we could begin uh, the tape. This is Senator uh, Kerry, and we are going to take a deposition of Mr. Octaviano Cesar uh, here in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica. And I'd like to ask Ms. Leslie Rowe, who is a consul uh, here in San Jose, who is empowered to deliver an oath, uh, to do so to our witness. Thank you. Cesar, could you please stand and raise your right hand? Mm -hmm. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, in answer to the several interrogatories and cross-interrogatories now to be put to you? I do. Thank you. Mr. Prado, do you solemnly swear or affirm that you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, in answer to the several interrogatories and cross-interrogatories now to be put to you? Yes, well. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, in answer to the several interrogatories and cross-interrogatories now to be put to you? Jura o afirma usted solemnemente que dirá la verdad, toda la verdad y nada más que la verdad, en respuesta a los diversos interrogatorios y contrainterrogatorios que se le formularán a usted ahora? Juro. At some time, though, you became the head, so to speak, of the Southern Front Air Force, is that correct? Eh, pero en algún momento usted se convirtió en el jefe de la Frente del Sur, de la Fuerza Aérea del Frente del Sur. Me convertí en el jefe de la Fuerza Aérea del Sur y en los últimos tiempos llegué a ser el segundo del comandante en Pastora. I became the head of the Southern Air Force and then uh, I became the second in command uh, with the Pastora. Did you become involved in the effort to, to change the government of Nicaragua in 1978-79? Yes, sir, I did. Do you want to describe that a little bit for us? Well, I, I began working against Somoza in 1977. Mainly I was plotting with the national, some of the National Guard's uh, officers because uh, my criteria was that the best outcome would have been to topple Somoza and create the uh, sort of national unity opposition with the political parties and some of the national guardsmen officers, which no, not all of them were bad. And uh, in that case, we will have closed the door to the communist takeover. And uh, even during the, the fight in 1979, uh, which I was in Costa Rica here in the Southern Front, uh, I, kept, I kept that uh, uh, purpose Bacteria, and I did plot with many of the officers and up to a point in which I uh, arranged a ceasefire five days before Somoza left in the commandos of Somoto and Ocotal uh, 
in order to have those people going to the ne uh, negotiating table. Unfortunately, I really don't know what happened. But, uh, well, that's history, you know. Instead of having that dialogue, Sandinistas took over, which something they didn't expect, really. Now, in 1982, you left Nicaragua because you were dissatisfied with the Sandinista regime. Usted dejó Nicaragua en 1982 porque no estaba satisfecho. Bueno, primero que todo, no con el no con el régimen sandinista. Nosotros somos siempre aclaramos eso, sino con el régimen marxista-leninista, porque ellos no son sandinistas. Not with the Sandinista regime. We always clarify that, but with the Marxist-Leninist regime, because they are not sandinistas. Porque nosotros creemos en los ideales de Sandino y no podemos aceptar que ellos sean sandinistas. We believe in the ideals of Sandino and we cannot accept that they are Sandinistas. Básicamente, sí, en 1982, cuando la Guardia Nacional de Nicaragua eh, voló unos puentes en el norte de Nicaragua. Basically, yes, in 1982, when the National Guard in Nicaragua blew up some bridges in the northern part of Nicaragua. Y el régimen de Managua endureció su posición. And the Managua regime uh, hardened their position. Eh, Yo tomé el camino al exilio cuando vi también el problema con los misquitos. I uh, went on exile when I saw the problem with the mosquitoes. Eh, vi la posibilidad de una guerra que era una guerra que yo no quería para mis hijos. Uh, I saw the possibility of war which I didn't want for my children. Eh, no quería que ellos pelearan por algo en lo que ellos no creían. I didn't want them to fight for something that they did not believe in. Y vine a Costa Rica. And I came to Costa Rica. A ver a mi familia que yo le había sacado de Nicaragua un par de meses antes. To see my family, which I had taken out of Nicaragua a few months previous. Conversé aquí a través de unos amigos con Eden Pastora. And through some friends here, I uh, talked uh, with Eden Pastora. Y él me ofreció integrarme a un movimiento para salvar esa revolución. And he offered me to uh, the possibility of getting involved in a movement to save the revolution. No para hacer contra revolución. Not to do the counter revolution. Porque yo creo que Nicaragua era necesaria una revolución. Because I believe in Nicaragua, it was necessary to have a revolution. Well, I appreciate the distinction that you drew, <coughs> and I think it's a good distinction. <coughs> um, you became the chief of logistics, really, for the Southern Front. Isn't that correct? No, exactamente. Not exactly. Eh, yo comencé a trabajar con el FRS de Pastora en el 82 como encargado de comunicaciones. I started to work for the FRS uh, for then Pastora in 82 as person in charge of communications. Posteriormente, eh, aproximadamente en octubre de 82, in about, in about October of 82, cuando hubo presiones sobre Pastora por parte del señor Alfonso Robelo, que era su, su compañero en Arde, when uh, Pastora was receiving pressure on the part of Robelo, who was his colleague in Arde, para que pusiera un ejecutivo, as to un ayudante ejecutivo, placing an assistant, an executive. Eh, Pastora me escogió a mí. Pastora chose me. Y desde entonces, pues, trabajé prácticamente hasta hasta el momento que todavía estoy con él eh, en ese en ese tarea, digamos. And since then, uh, till now, um, I have been working with him in that endeavor. Was it fair to say that you were in charge of uh, the records, the resupply? Uh, this is Carol Prado. The organizational, for your organizational skills that the Southern Front needed. Sí, se podría decir eso, eh, porque yo era prácticamente eh, la liga de pastora con cada uno de los distintos sectores, tanto políticos como militares, en que estaba formado Arde. You could say that uh, I was the link, uh, you could say, uh, between Pastora and the other sectors that were connected to it, political and military. Y también eh, la, la liga entre Pastora y el mundo exterior, digamos, gente de los Estados Unidos o de Venezuela, o cualquiera que quería trabajar o acercarse a Pastora, pues pasaba a través mío. Uh, so the link between, my, between Pastora and the outside world, the United States or Venezuela, or anyone in the outside that wanted to be in contact with Pastora then would have to do it through me. Segment uh, two, in the next segment, that was simply an introduction to each of them, to their roles. The next segment, you'll hear how George Morales, the narcotics trafficker, became a benefactor of the Southern Front. After the May 30th La Penca bombing, and the cutoff of U.S. aid, Arde was very short of funds and was disintegrating. 
Marta Healy, whom we've heard about from Gary Betzner, the pilot, was an acquaintance of uh, Cesar. Uh, and he told, she told uh, Cesar and Mr. Popo Chamorro uh, that Morales, George Morales, wanted to donate an airplane and cash to Pastora on the southern front. So uh, Cesar flew back to Costa Rica, informed Pastora of that, and Pastora instructed Cesar to look into the offer, and he flew with Popo Chamorro and Marcus Aguado to Miami. In November, or sometime in that vicinity, uh, Chamorro, Cesar, and Prado met with Morales at the house of Marta Healy. He offered to donate a plane, uh, and the Southern Front Contras at that time were in need of hardware and funds. An arrangement was made to obtain the plane, uh, which was in Haiti. Uh, in order to deliver the plane from Haiti to El Salvador, Morales recommended a pilot, uh, that the pilot be Aguado. Uh, Cesar was later informed that a plane did arrive at Ilopango Air Base, and it was used to ferry ammunition to La Penca Airport. Uh, Octaviano Cesar and Marcus Aguado also describe a trip to the Bahamas with George Morales, and on their return, Morales and Cesar uh, Morales uh, asked Cesar to bring several hundred thousand dollars through customs for him, and you will hear directly how some of this money uh, was laundered. Segment two, please. It reminds between Pastora and the outside world, the United States or Venezuela, or anyone in the outside that wanted to be in. That's Carol Prado. To do it through me. Now, sometime during that period that you were working with Pastora, you came to meet Mr. George Morales. Sí, es correcto. Eh, exactamente en este mismo hotel. That is correct, exactly here in this hotel. Okay, would you state the circumstances of that? Bueno, me voy a extender un poquito porque es muy interesante y... I will be extensive because it's quite interesting. Y es parte de todo un, una, un proceso. And it's a part of a, a whole process. Eh, después de la atentado contra Pastora eh, de la Penca del 30 de mayo del 84. After the plot uh, against the Pastora in La Penca on May 30th, 1984. Y el corte de la ayuda norteamericana que ocurrió ese mismo día. And the cutoff of the North American aid which took place that same day. Eh, Arde, eh, Arde entró en un proceso de, de falta de fondos Arde then initiated a lack of funds process y de una cierta desintegración por la ida de Robelo, la ida del Nero Chamorro and some disintegration because of uh, Robelo and Negro Chamorro leaving a unirse con el FDN to join the FDN eh, Como consecuencia de esa gente que se fue, se fue el segundo de Pastora que se llamaba Harold Martínez. And uh, due to the fact that these two people left, uh, the second man uh, for Pastora, which was Harold Martínez, left also. Después de una reunión en el río San Juan de todos los comandantes de Pastora, se eligió segundo comandante a Popo Chamorro. After a meeting at the, perdón, ¿me puede, después de una reunión en, en el río San Juan. En el río San Juan. After a meeting at the San Juan River, then the second in command was uh, named. Uh, Adolfo, Adolfo Popo Chamorro. Adolfo Popo Chamorro. Eh, el, al mismo tiempo se aproximaron a Pastora eh, la gente de Alfredo y Octaviano César. And at the same time, Pastora was approached by. Um, Octaviano y Alfredo César como nuevos aliados políticos como consecuencia de la falta de fondos eh, se decidió que el señor Chamorro fuera a los Estados Unidos con el señor César a buscar, a buscar fondos eso puede haber sido aproximadamente en el mes de agosto septiembre del 84 that could have been more or less August, September of 1984. Después que el señor Pastora regresó de Washington, eh, donde se había cortado totalmente los lazos con la Central de Inteligencia Americana. Where uh, Pastora came back from Washington, uh, a trip where the 
all the aid from the um, Central Intelligence Agency was cut off. Eh, luego de ese viaje del señor eh, César y el señor Chamorro, After that trip, uh, Mr. Chamorro ellos regresaron como unos 15 o 20 días después they returned about 15 or 20 days later con la noticia de que habían conseguido ayuda with the news that they had uh, gotten help or aid como decía Popo el Chamorro él, él regresaba con el pan bajo el brazo as Popo Chamorro said uh, that he was coming back and this is a Spanish expression with a loaf of bread under his arm cosa que a nosotros nos alegró mucho after por... coming from where después from de Miami. regresar de donde de Miami. from Miami from Miami mm -hmm. Él, who, who came back? Popo Chamorro? A, a Octaviano César. Octaviano César. Ole. Eh, ellos nos reunieron a nosotros y nos enseñaron unas fotos. They got us together and they showed us some photographs. De un avión who is us? ¿Quién es eh, eh, Tito Chamorro, Carol Prado, Sergio Arguello, eh, Miguel Urro, que éramos, digamos, el resto de los cuadros principales de Arde. Which was the rest of the main cadres of Arde. Nos enseñaron, yo, yo voy a tratar cuando, cuando use pronombres de decir los nombres mejor. Entonces nos enseñaron una foto a, a los que estábamos ahí de un avión Howard y un avión DC-4. So they showed us some photographs of a Howard plane and a DC-4. Nos dijeron que esos aviones se los habían regalado y que nos iban a regalar seis aviones adicionales Navajo Panther. And they said that these planes had been a gift, had been given to us, and that the six additional planes were going to be given to us. Navajo Panther. Panther. Navajo. Yo no sé mucho de aviones, pero sé que son unos aviones muy rápidos y de largo alcance. I know that, I don't know much about airplanes, but I know that they're very fast airplanes and a long range airplanes. Did they say where they, who was going to give them, where they were coming from? Dijeron quién se los iba a dar o de dónde venían. Sí, dijeron que tenían un, que a través de la esposa anterior de Popo Chamorro, la esposa número uno de Popo Chamorro. They said that through the wife number one of Popo Chamorro. Que también es la esposa número dos porque se divorció y se casó con ella otra vez. Which is, she's also wife number two because she, he divorced her and remarried her. Are we talking about Marta Healy? Es bueno, yo la, yo, de Marta Gil? Sí, yo la conozco como Marta Reyes. I know her as Marta Reyes. But, and do you also know that she is Marta Healy who lives in Miami? Sí, Marta Healy, which was Adolfo Chamorro's former wife and an old friend of mine for more than 20 years. Uh, she told me that somebody she knew wanted to contribute with the anti-communist cause and was willing to give a C-46 airplane and some cash to Pastora. She told you that here at a meeting in... Uh, no, she told me that in Miami. In Miami, yes. You were there on business at the time? Yes, sir. Okay. She volunteered this information to you? That's right. She okay. came forward with that. <clears throat> I returned to Costa Rica. I told Pastor about it. And that uh, he asked me to pursue this matter. And uh, I went with Popo Chamorro back to Miami. Did she tell you the name of the person at that time? Yes, she did. What was the name? George Morales. Okay. Did you know who George Morales was? No, sir. Had you ever met him? No, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I went back to Miami with Popo, and I met Morales at Marta's house. Uh, he showed it Do you me. recall approximately when that was? I think it was around November 1984. 1984. I think so. Anyway, uh, he confirmed the offer and showed me the picture of the airplane. C-46 or DC-3, you know, they look very similar. Could you be a little more specific? I mean, what were the circumstances? You walked into the house, who was there? Uh, he was there. Anybody else? Marta. Anyone else? Uh, Popo Chamorro, myself. Just the uh, four of you? Yes, sir. All right. And uh, you went there with what purpose in mind? Purpose of, uh, of meeting this person who was willing to give this airplane. Uh, at the time, the troops here, the aid was cut off, and the, the troops in the field, although uh, I knew that Arde had some ammo in El Salvador, storage there, they didn't have any way to bring it over to, to, to the fighting area. That was the, the, you know, the total purpose of it. So you told Papa Chamorro that uh, the opportunity was there to get a hold of an airplane no, and that Pastora. this could be very helpful. You told Pastora. Pastora, Pastora asked Popo and myself to go and pursue the matter. Fine. How, did, how was the matter brought up in the meeting when well, we first came, met? He came forward and said, listen, I'm an anti-communist. I believe in the 
fighting against the Sandinistas. I have this airplane in Haiti, which I'm not using it. Uh, I cannot bring it to the state because it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't meet the FAA requirements. But uh, we can make arrangements so you can fly that airplane back to El Salvador. Had you learned anything about George Morales at that time? No, sir. Did Marta Healy tell you anything about him? No, sir. Did you know anything about his background? No, sir. Were you curious about it? Of course. Did you take any steps to find out anything about his background? Yes, I did. What did you do? I spoke to Marta and I told her, you know, I told her who is this person and that uh, she told me who it was. And what did she say? Uh, she, she didn't say that he was a drug trafficker. She says that uh, he was a businessman, that he had a, an airplane business in Opaloka, that he was a world champion of uh, boat racing, and that uh, she thought he was involved in funny business. Funny business? Yes, sir. She described it? Yes, sir. Did you know what funny business meant? I, I guess it, yes. Sir. And what did you guess it meant? I guess that he was a crook. And did you know in what form? No, but I... <laughs> well, what did you think at that time? Did you think he was doing drugs? Did you think he was embezzling money from banks? Did you think he was robbing banks? No, what kind I, of crook did you I think he was? I thought he could be doing drugs. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, did you and Papa Chamorro discuss that at that time? Yes, we did. And that... Uh, uh, prior to that, Pastora, I said publicly, that he had received a couple of helicopters from drug traffickers. May I? Uh, I'm not proud of having this, having had this type of relationship. Uh, but the circumstances there, uh, and because in a, all the conversation that was present, he never, he never preconditioned any type of business with him. Uh, Tell me about the circumstances. You, you felt at that time that the cause was in such need that it was important to get the products you needed, is that correct? Yes, the troops, they didn't have boots, they were running barefoot, hardly had any clothes, didn't have medicine, didn't have enough ammunition to fight. Uh, the Sandinistas, they were putting up a big offensive. Uh, they were young kids and they were going to get killed. Mm -hmm. you know, simple as that. I mean, uh, these people, they went into a war because they love freedom and because the U.S. Congress gave them the means to do so. Okay. At that time, uh, what arrangement did you make with Mr. Morales? The only precondition he asked was a meet with Pastora, a meeting with Pastora. Also, did he say where the meeting had to take place? No, he would say it was at Pastora's disposal. Uh, we came back told Pastor about it. Before you yes. do that, what, was any final arrangement made with respect to the C-46? Uh, just in principle, just uh, that he was going to, you know, give that plane and he was going to give cash to Pastor. And that uh, <laughs> then he needed a was there Was there any doubt in your mind where the plane had come from? He said it was in Haiti. I didn't have okay. any idea. Uh, and the cash, did you know at that time the cash was uh, the, the result of uh, drug transactions? Well, he had a combination of, of, uh, of drug business and, and uh, legitimate business. Huh? What was the next step at okay. that point? Next step, uh, Marcos Aguado went with Popo Chamorro to Miami. I arrived about a week later. Huh? And uh, they picked me up at the airport, Morales, Chamorro and Aguado. We went to the Opaloka airport and stayed at his office, Morales' office. He has several airplanes there. This is when? About a month later. 1984? Yes, okay. at the end of 1984. Uh, anyway, at the office, we discussed the technical part of flying that airplane. I mean, they did. I'm not a pilot and that uh, how the airplane needed a little bit of adjustment, and et cetera, et cetera, and where it was going to be flown. Marcos Aguado said that he had made arrangement that that plane to be flown into the Ilopango military air base in El Salvador, and that he was going to fly it. Then Morales say, I want to try it out. And he said, why don't we go to the Bahamas, four of us, and another pilot, his pilot. And so we can try the skills of Marcos Aguado. We did so, 
who went to Bimini, and that uh, it was about uh, noon time, close to noon time. And we went to Bimini, and we returned the same day from Bimini. Uh, we went to, I remember, a bar or anywhere used to go there. I remember those. L let me um, just interrupt you there, if I can, for one minute. Was there a discussion in Miami prior to that about transferring funds, making arrangements for the transfer of funds? No, sir. Okay, do you recall any discussions about funds at that time? Well, in general, that uh, we needed not only the plane, but because we hardly didn't even have money just to, just to pay for the fuel on, on the plane. So no, you, no, you no, were no, still no. pushing for cash? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, go ahead. You were saying you went to Bimini, you went to the uh, bar that was frequented by Hemingway? That's right. And Go ahead. No, 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 I'm waiting. On the return, about 15 minutes before landing, uh, he pulled out some checks and asked Popo Chamorro and myself, I said, listen, uh, I'm going to give that money to this morning to Pastore. Now, I need for you to, to declare in U.S. customs this check. Uh, <coughs> being a businessman, it might sound ridiculous or stupid, but uh, at that moment I was not acting as a businessman. I was really, I was really trying to convince this person to give some aid. And that's the truth. I mean, and the check that he pulled out was a check for $400,000? Or checks totaling $400,000? I didn't count it, and that's the honest truth, sir. Okay. And I know there were several hundred thousand dollars. You knew it was a significant sum yes. of money? Oh, yes. A significant okay. sum of money. And it was cash? I didn't see any cash. No, I mean, it was going oh, to be yes. cash right. uh, through right. the transaction right. that was taking place. Right. And you knew that, uh, well, go ahead. Go well, we landed at Opaloka, went through immigration. Let me be more clear now. What he was asking you to do was effectively uh, take this money through customs for him, correct? Well, uh, you could say that it was, the way he put it, is to take this money through customs for Pastora. Okay. But the money at that time was coming from Morales? Yes. Okay. yes and you were taking custody of it in order to put it through the customs process? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, you knew at that time that uh, the money uh, was coming from Mr. Morales, a drug trafficker? Well, he didn't say that. I know it was coming from him. But you knew that? I knew, I, by the time I knew that he was involved in drug trafficking, yes, sir. What was the, and when you landed, what happened? Uh, we went through immigration and custom. I filled out uh, an application form, and we were out in 15 minutes. Okay, well, let me show so, you this uh, and esto? ask if uh, you recognize this as it's a... Marcus Aguado. Customs form. Okay. Eh, yo le dije antes de que no recordaba yo la presencia de Octaviano en el viaje. Ahora que lo veo, sí. Porque yo iba con el piloto adelante y ellos tres iban atrás. ¿Ustedes recuerdan si en ese viaje, durante ese viaje, hubo un intercambio de cheques? Sí, cuando regresamos, eh, no, no intercambio de que si Morales le dio uno o César le dio otro o, o, o Chamorro le dio otro. Sí, yes, uh, no exchange in that, fa in, in that uh, César o Chamorro o Morales gave a check. Pero sí recuerdo que cuando regresamos, eh, back, el señor Morales le pidió a Chamorro de que le ingresara una cantidad de, de dinero a los Estados Unidos, a la aduana de los Estados Unidos, uh, y lo registraron. El señor Morales, perdón, le pidió el favor a Chamorro. Pero mm -hmm. recuerdo que en el camino de regreso, el señor Morales le pidió a Chamorro que introdujera dinero a los Estados Unidos. Supuestamente, 
creo yo, era para ayuda, para comprar uniforme, bota o algunas cosas, ¿verdad?, que se necesitaban en ese momento. Yo asumí que era para ayudar a comprar botas y uniformes y ese tipo de ayuda que se necesitaba en ese momento. Pero nunca vi el dinero. Pero nunca vi el dinero. Creo que regresó a manos de Morales. I think that it went back to Morales' hands. Did he see the checks? ¿Usted vio los cheques? No. No. Okay, well, how do you know about this transaction? ¿Cómo sabe usted de esa transacción? Y va adelante en la cabina con el piloto platicando del avión, del ranch del avión. I was up front uh, with the pilot talking to him about the airplane and the range of the airplane. Y uno va sin querer oyendo lo que está sucediendo. Without wanting to you hear what's going on. En ese momento, sin poner mucha atención. At that time, without paying too much attention. Porque también yo pensaba de que este señor Morales era una tabla de salvación para el movimiento anticomunista que estaba en el sur. Because I thought also at that time that Mr. Morales was a bridge of salvation for the anti-communist movement in the south. Why did, why did you think that? ¿Qué pensó usted de eso? Alguien que regala un avión que who gives an airplane, a mí en lo personal no me pide nada a cambio. Who's not asking me for anything in exchange for that person. Cuando logramos hablar un poco más él y yo, me dijo si quería trabajar con él. When we talked a little bit more, uh, he and I, he asked me if I wanted to work with him. Le dije que no, que tenía una trayectoria política en mi país y una trayectoria militar y que mi condición no me permitía hacer nada de eso, que le agradecía la confianza que había depositado en mí. I said uh, that no, that my political and military trajectory in my country I, I didn't allow me to do that, and, but I appreciated the confidence or the trust that he had placed on me. Me felicitó por la respuesta que le di. He congratulated me for that answer. Y me regaló 500 dólares para los días que estuve en Miami para que me ayudara con mis gastos. And he gave me five, and he gave me 500 dollars uh, so that I could uh, pay my expenses in Miami during those five days I was there. Did you have occasion to say to someone in the CIA that uh, Morales was helping and you were getting money from him? Uh, and you were concerned about that because you knew he was a drug dealer. Did you pass that information on to somebody? Yes, I passed the information about about, about the not the relation because it wasn't what well, you might call it the relation and the airplane. Yes, and the, of course, I mean the the CIA people at the American military attaches. They were they were based at the Ilopango also, and the, you know. I mean, any person or any plane landing there, they have to know where it came from or whatever. And they basically said to you that uh, it was all right as long as you don't deal in the powder. Is that correct? Is that a fair quote? Yes. Now, um, <clears throat> at what point in time did you learn that Mr. Morales also was involved with drugs? ¿En qué momento Marcos Aguado. el señor Morales también estaba vinculado a las drogas? Cuando me ofreció trabajo. When he offered me work. And that was during your first trip to Miami. Y ese fue durante su, eso fue durante su primer viaje a Miami. La única vez que lo conocí en Miami. The only time I met him or knew him in Miami. Can you describe that conversation to us? How did you, how did you find out that it was drugs that he wanted you to work at? Eh, ¿Puede describir esa conversación? ¿Cómo supo usted que era drogas o que él quería que usted trabajara? Eh, Dejó entrever de que él trabajaba con marihuana. He let it be understood that he worked with marijuana. Que producía mucho dinero y que él tenía una organización bien segura. That he produced a lot of money and that he had a very safe organization. Now, none of the uh, three individuals testifying were aware of the Morales weapons deals but all three had knowledge of weapons shipments generally to the southern front. For instance, Aguado stated that uh, he only moved weapons from an unnamed third country. Uh, all three of them provided information about the supply process for the Contras, and according to Prado, Papo Chamorro and Octaviano Cesar brought $50,000 with them from Morales on another occasion to cover support for the troops. 
Uh, Prado was in charge of the resupply operations, and he was Pastora's link to the outside world. He describes uh, how before the Lapenka bombing, John Hull's ranch was used as a primary site for that resupply effort. Now, there's nothing surprising about weapons and supplies being shipped to the Contras. That's been documented before on many occasions, and there was a period where one part of the network was well known. What is significant at the end of this next segment is the point that Aguado confirms, which we have stated again and again, which is that many of the same connections, airstrips, and people used in the delivery of weapons were also used in the delivery of drugs. How did you how did you find out that it was drugs that he wanted you to work at? Marcus Aguado, and this is the end of the last segment. I'm sorry, but it re-spins on us here, and there's no way to cue it. Dejó entrever de que él trabajaba con marihuana. He let it be understood that he worked with marijuana. Que producía mucho dinero y que él tenía una organización bien segura. That he produced a lot of money and that he had a very safe organization. My apologies for that. We're uh, struggling with the technology here. Now, also, did you not arrange a number of uh, flights for uh, the transport of weapons with Mr. Uh, Morales? Hizo usted hizo arreglos para varios vuelos para transportar armas para el señor Morales. Nunca. Cuando el señor men, eh, Morales mensabas. I never rented it. I never flew it. Uh, I did see the airplane at the Pavas Airport here. But it never Do you came. know of any weapons uh, shipments that were arranged, or any other kinds of shipments arranged by Mr. Morales? No. Lo único que supe fue sobre dinero. All I knew was about mo uh, what I didn't know about was the money. El señor Octaviano César y el señor Chamorro. Mr. Octaviano César and Mr. Chamorro. En el primer viaje que vinieron. In the first trip when they came. Trajeron con ellos 50 mil dólares. Brought with them 50 thousand dollars. Who brought the 50 thousand? Eh, ellos dijeron que se los había dado el, el señor Morales, el benefactor. They said that it had been given uh, by Mr. Morales, the benefactor. Who said that? Eh, Popo Chamorro. Popo Chamorro. Now, to your knowledge, were weapons shipments arranged from Miami uh, to uh, support the activities on the southern front? ¿Sabe usted que se hayan hecho viajes de armas desde Miami para apoyar las actividades en el frente sur? Vea, con los maratones y la falta de ayuda del gobierno americano y la presencia del comandante Pastora en Miami. With the marathons and the lack of support of the U.S. government for, in the presence of Commander Pastor in Miami. Y conferencias de prensa que daba abiertas al mundo entero. And press conferences, open press conferences, which he gave to the whole world. Le regalaban carabinas M1-30. <coughs> they gave him a M1-30. Uh, AR-15. R-15. Y algunas municiones que se venden en los gun shops de Miami. And some ammunition that's sold at the gun shops in Miami. Eh, una de las veces muchos uniformes, 3,000 uniformes, 3,000 pares de botas. Once a large number of uniforms, 3,000 uniforms, 3,000 pairs of boots. Y él las trajo personalmente con eh, Adolfo Chamorro y creo que con Adol eh, Carol Prado también. And he brought them personally, I think, with Adolfo Chamorro and I think uh, Carol Prado too. Es correcto. Do you recall what airline or what aircraft brought the guns you talked about from the Florida gun stores? ¿Usted recuerda qué aeronave trajo las armas o municiones de las tiendas de Florida o fue el avión de ustedes? No, fue en el avión donde venían los tres mil uniformes y los tres mil pares de botas. No, it was on the airplane where the, on which the three thousand uh, uniforms and three thousand pairs of boots uh, were brought. Un avión del señor Sarki. A plane which belonged to Mr. Sarki. No creo que haya sido ninguna arma de guerra del gobierno de los Estados Unidos. I don't think it was any war weapon of the government of the United States. Carabinas y AR-15. Sarki, a Sarki Sarkinalian, an indicted arms trafficker. Well, now, 
Do you personally recall flying a C-47 with those weapons? Haber eh, volado un C-47 con esas armas. Probablemente sí. Probably yes. Era el único avión que había. It was the only plane available. The C-47. El C-47. Mm -hmm. And where did you fly that from? Y de dónde lo voló? De un país centroamericano a la pista de la penca en Nicaragua. From a Central American country to the La Penca landing strip in Nicaragua. Do you recall when that would have been? Recuerda cuando ocurrió eso. Probablemente después de entre octubre y diciembre del 84. Probably between October and December 1984. Did you continue to fly those flights into 1985? Continuó usted haciendo estos vuelos en 1985? Es correcto, hasta principios del 86 donde ya no teníamos nada, nada en absoluto que acarrear. Yes, until early 1986 when we no longer had anything at all to, to carry. Okay. Chamorro, a second in command from uh, Pastora took over all the arrangements okay. and everything. What, what was the sequence of events? You landed in Miami. Yes. When was that plane then dispatched to Ilopango? Octaviano says, uh, I don't know. I never saw the plane myself. I never seen the plane. I know that the plane arrived in Ilopango sometime later. Maybe, How did maybe. you know that? Because Popo Chamorro told me. And uh, Tito Chamorro. And, uh, and then I met Marcos Aguaro after he had returned from the trip. Do you know who made the arrangements for this plane to go to Ilopango? No, sir. Uh, you, you, excuse me, just a, yes. just a minute. Which plane are we talking about here? The C-46? That's my understanding, That's, yes. Now, was there another aircraft that uh, wound up going from uh, Morales to uh, Ilopango? I don't know about it. You only are aware of the C-46? And that's the only one that I, I saw him in a picture. I saw the plane in a picture, never seen it, really. And I, I heard her say mm -hmm. that the, the plane was ferrying ammo from Ilopango into the airfield of La Penca, which is in the northern part of the Rio San Juan, that at the time was held by Pastora. Never saw the plane uh, because I, I mean, I was not involved into, into that part, you know, into those areas of so went over there. Do you have any knowledge of how the arrangements were made for that plane to land at Ilopango? No, sir. Okay. <coughs> you only know that it did? Yes. On a previous flight, en un vuelo anterior, previo. Marcus John Hull planned a weapons delivery with you, correct? El señor John Hull planeó una entrega de armas con usted, ¿es correcto? Mucho antes de mayo del 84. Way before May 84. Okay. When approximately, could you tell us? Aproximadamente cuándo? Todo el 83. All of 83. Y primeros meses del 84. In the first few months of 84. Okay. Do you know of other flights that took place in which either money came in or weapons? No. Well, you know of weapons that were arranged uh, <coughs> at John Hull's farm. Eh, posiblemente, yo, yo recuerdo vuelo antes de la penca, o sea, con el señor John Hull. I remember flights before la penca with con, Mr. John Hull. Hay una frontera que es la penca. There is a border which is la penca. Antes de la penca era un John Hull con nosotros, simpático, colaborador, entusiasta. Before, before la penca, uh, it was John Hull was. Uh, very uh, cooperative with us and he was very nice to us. Después de la penca fue todo lo contrario. And after la penca it was quite the contrary. Antes de la penca sí había vuelo de El Salvador a, a la finca de John Hall. Before la penca there were flights from El Salvador para nosotros. to the John Hall's farm. Para, para, para la gente pastora. For digamos, us, para, for pastoras people. With weapons. Perdón? With weapons. Con armas, sí. With weapons. And now we come to the very last segment. And in the last segment, the three of them discuss the question of drug trafficking. 
according to Aguado, drug traffickers took advantage of the anti-communist sentiment throughout most of uh, Central America. He admits that narco dollars provided easy, quick money for the troops' dire needs. Aguado also implies that Geraldo Duran, whose name incidentally has been mentioned previously in testimony here, who was a Contra pilot, was involved in drug trafficking. Carol Prado states that drug money was used to support the Contra troops. He also maintains that Geraldo Duran was a drug pilot and he mentions Jose Angel Guerra as a pilot for the cartel. Prado testifies that before the La Penca bombing, John Hull's ranch may have been used as a drug transit base. Cesar admits that he knew drug money was supporting the Contras and that while he wasn't proud of it, the Contras were desperate. He also makes the point that numerous intelligence agencies, both U.S. and foreign, were aware uh, that drug money was being used to support them. So we move to the final segment. And after La Penca, it was quite the contrary. Turn it up. Antes de La Penca, sí había un vuelo de El Salvador a, a la finca de John Hall. Before La Penca, there were flights from El Salvador para nosotros. to the John Hall's farm. Para, para, para la gente pastora, digamos. Para pastoras, people. With weapons. With weapons. Pardon? With weapons. Con armas, sí. With weapons. And you needed help. Nosotros tenemos, necesitábamos ayuda y ojalá no solo los Estados Unidos, todo el mundo lo hubiéramos querido. Uh, and uh, not only from the United States, we would have uh, wanted this uh, help from the whole world. Pero sin condiciones. But without uh, any strings attached. So, now, what what strings did Mr. Morales attach to it, if any? Cuando Popo dejó el avión en manos de Morales en mi impresión eh, el análisis que hicimos con Eden estábamos, había una cuerda, había un string <laughs> cuerda es string, ¿verdad? Sí, sí. Eh, cuando, el, 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 when uh, Popo left the plane in the hands of Mr. Morales in my opinion there was a string eh, nos estábamos prestando a, a que se hicieran cosas no políticas <coughs> con un disfraz político we were allowing non-political non things to be done with the political guys. Cuando Popo habla de suministrar combustible a aviones que pasan para el norte cargados de droga, estamos poniendo condiciones. When Popo talks about uh, provi providing fuel for planes which go north with uh, drugs, then there are strings attached. To Hay algo importante que se me quedaba. Did Popo talk about that? En esa reunión, en esa que yo le llamo la reunión de la esquina, donde Popo, Tito y Octaviano me llamaron a mí, hablaron de eso. At the corner meeting when Popo, Tito and Octaviano called me, they talked about that. Then specifically, what did they talk about? Que se intentaba que aviones pasaran por la zona donde nosotros teníamos eh, aeropuertos dentro de Nicaragua y que se les iba a dar combustible. The planes uh, go through the areas uh, and we provide fuel for them. What planes? En ese tiempo teníamos el aeropuerto de La Penca, teníamos el aeropuerto de Atlanta. At that time we had La, la Penca Airport and the Atlanta Airport. Uh, what, what, cosa... what planes would go through and get fuel? What planes are you referring to? Drug planes? Sí, aviones de droga. Yes, drug planes. Sí. Eh, ahí quiero señalar algo muy importante. Was that going to mean money for Popo Chamorro and the effort? Is that what the deal was? In exchange for the fuel, the planes came through and you got sí. cash. It's my understanding that you also know some of the pilots who were flying drugs in and out. Entiendo que usted conoce también algunos de los pilotos que traían droga. Uh, el único que conocí que supe que andaba en droga porque lo detuvieron aquí fue a Gerardo Durán. The only one I knew who, uh, who was flying drugs because they arrested him here was Gerardo Durán. Y a José Guerra porque tiene una compañía de aerotaxis aquí. And José Guerra who has Can we turn it up a little bit, please? Taxi. And they were flying out of the Hull Ranch, among other places, is that correct? Estaban volando a partir de la finca de John Hall, entre otros lugares. Hasta donde yo sé, ellos usaban varias fincas de John Hall. As far as I knew, they used several of John Hall's farms. Después de la penca, usaban un lugar que se llamaba Mónico. 
After La Penca, they used a place called Monico. Eh, incluso eh, hubo un accidente de un avión en la finca de John Holland. There was an accident they, of a plane of John Holland. When flights. you say they used, they used both for the drug flights and for the weapons flights? No, por, por drogas no puedo decir porque no, no me consta. No, I can't say for drugs because I, I would not know for certain. Pero yo sé que ellos volaban en general en suministro, ya lo que llevaban no, no podría decirle después de la penca. I knew that they flied in supplies generally. But after La Penca, I don't know specifically. Antes de La Penca, nunca se oyó hablar de droga. Before La Penca, we never heard about drugs. Now, you also said to Mr. Blum in the same conversation that the drug activity <coughs> revolved around Eden Pastora. You knew that, but you couldn't do anything about it. Is that accurate? En la conversación que tuvo con el señor Blum, también dijo que eh, usted que esa actividad eh, con las drogas es, se llevaba a cabo alrededor de Eden Pastora, pero que usted no podía hacer nada. That he couldn't do anything about it. Durán nos ayudó eh, a nosotros cuando comenzamos la, la lucha. Durán helped us when we started with the fight, with the struggle como un muchacho a sueldo que cobraba por cada vuelo dentro de Costa Rica, jamás dentro de Nicaragua. As a salaried man, uh, he would charge for each flight that he would perform in Costa Rica, never in Nicaragua. Por ejemplo, nosotros alquilábamos aviones medianos en Costa Rica, Durán lo llevaba a una pista. For example, we would rent medium-sized airplanes here in Costa Rica and Durán would take them to an airstrip. Lo tomaba yo y hacía vuelos con arma hacia adentro de Nicaragua o cualquier clase de suministro. And I would take it then and uh, fly it uh, into Nicaragua with uh, weapons or whatever other kind of... Uh, por desgracia, supply. este tipo de, de trabajo por la liberación de un pueblo, este tipo de entrega, es muy, muy, muy parecido al que usa la gente del narcotráfico. Unfortunately, uh, this kind of activity, which is for the freeing of a people uh, is quite similar uh, to the activities of the drug traffickers. Yo entiendo eh, que muchas de las conexiones de costarricenses, eh, de mucha de la forma del trabajo que nosotros habíamos organizado para para ayudar a la revolución que se estaba dando en el sur. Uh, I understand that many of the connections, a lot of the work that we have done. Uh, uh, to help the southern probablemente ellos usaron las mismas para el asunto de la droga they might have used the same to for the traffic of drugs the same what la misma que eh, probablemente las mismas pistas eh, conexiones con amistades que le podían decir de que lo que llegaba allí eran armas para en pastora uh, y probablemente eran drogas para Los Estados Unidos, the same no connections, the same airstrips, the same people, and uh, maybe they said that uh, it was weapons for the Pastora and it was actually drugs that would later on go to the United States or something like that. But you have already confirmed privately, and I would like you to to state uh, now. Pero ustedes ya han confirmado en privado y quisiera que declarara ahora. As others have. Como lo han hecho otros that narcotics trafficking became confused in the efforts que el to support anti-Sandinista efforts. Que el tráfico de narcóticos eh, de alguna manera se confundió con los esfuerzos eh, por eh, apoyar los esfuerzos eh, Is that accurate? Sandinistas. ¿Es eso correcto? Indiscutiblemente. Undoubtedly. Aprovecharon el sentimiento anticomunista que existe en Centroamérica, en Costa Rica, en El Salvador, en Honduras, en Guatemala, en Panamá. They took, a, they took advantage of the anti-communist sentiment which exists in Central America, in Honduras, in Salvador, in uh, Costa Rica, in Panamá. Lo usaron para el narcotráfico, indiscutiblemente. Mm -hmm. Engañaron a la gente. And they undoubtedly used it for drug trafficking. They fooled people. And you know this of your personal knowledge, correct? Y usted tiene conocimiento personal de esto, ¿es cierto? Es correcto. Yes. He was from Esteli, but que, first he'd like to clarify the general. Como consecuencia de la experiencia que yo tuve en todo esto. 
that as a consequence of the experience that I had in all this, especially towards the end of 84, beginning of 85, donde agentes oficiales de la CIA en Costa Rica, where uh, agents of the CIA here in Costa Rica, donde un agente de la CIA en los Estados Unidos le dijo a Pedro Joaquín Chamorro, where an agent of the CIA in the United States told Pedro Joaquín Chamorro, donde un agente de la CIA en los Estados Unidos le dijo a Arturo Cruz, where an agent of the CIA in the United States told Arturo Cruz, de que yo estaba involucrado en drogas, that I was involved in drugs, yo me volví prácticamente un investigador, I practically turned into an investigator, porque eh, consideré que era un ataque eminentemente político because I, I thought that it was and, uh, y quise llegar al fondo del asunto it, it was basically a political attack and I wanted to uh, get to the bottom of it y esa es la razón por lo que conozco muchos nombres y tengo mucha información porque la he estudiado y la he recabado that's the reason uh, why I have so many names and a lot of information because I've looked into it uh, what, what uh, did you find out uh, as you looked into it? what did you discover about uh, drug trafficking among these people? Yo diría que concurrieron dos cosas, ya. Eh, por un lado, traficantes que se acercaron a agrupaciones políticas, hand, como Arde, drug traffickers that approached uh, political groups like Arde, tratando de, eh, de hacer tratos eh, que le dieran un cierto camuflaje, una cierta cobertura a su actividad. Trying to make deals that would somehow camouflage or cover up their activities. Por un lado. Por el otro lado, hand, creo que hubo eh, personas de la Agencia Central de Inteligencia Americana que le tendieron trampas a algunos compañeros nuestros muy débiles ideológicamente. That uh, they set up traps for some of our ideological colleagues who were ideologically excitaron, weak. Que les excitaron su vanidad. That got them excited or with que les prometieron Que les prometieron que si se quitaba Pastora ellos iban a ser los jefes. That maybe were promised that if Pastora was removed they would uh, end up being the leaders. <coughs> Recall that when we talked, you expressed to me uh, concern in retrospect that you had dealt with Morales. And you mentioned to me uh, that at the time you justified it in your own mind. And I wonder if you could share uh, with us exactly uh, what it was you were thinking about uh, when you realized he was a drug trafficker and, and continued to deal with him. Well, to be absolutely honest with you, never entered into my mind, of course, having anything to do with the business. Uh, but uh, I was thinking in terms of the security of my country. I mean, the type of fight we are against it is not just against the communists. Yeah? It's against the people that oppose Reagan. My brother said once in the Washington Post, the day that President Reagan said that he was a contra, uh, just about, which is about those debates. You know, I mean, so we have had to fight in all different type of fronts. And uh, yes, I'm very concerned because I, don't, I hate what's happened to me, to be absolutely honest. But uh, uh, I like to read history books. I know when the security of the United States have been in danger. You have used some type of people like that. I remember the Mr. Luciano before the invasion of Sicily. Yeah, I mean, even Mr. Stalin, I mean, uh, there's no comparison between these people and Stalin. But uh, you thought about the security of the United States, it was more important to have an, uh, some type of arrangement with, with Mr. Stalin against Hitler. Uh, that doesn't justify, I'm not trying to say that. But uh, at the moment, uh, I just didn't enter my mind that I would have become involved in such a mess, you know, because it never entered my mind to be any type of business. If I was going to do any business, with anyone, I would never do it through Arde, because Arde was absolutely checked 100% by the Sandinistas, by the CIA. They knew exactly what everybody was doing there, by the Costa Ricans, by the Israelis. There are at least maybe about a dozen of, of, of intelligence uh, agencies here in Costa Rica. And everybody was after Arde, which was the only operation of here, of Costa Rica. So, uh, I mean, just, just for, for logic, you know, uh, of course, uh, it's not the same to see Pastora or Pope or other ones have to go. I went a couple of times inside of Nicaragua and I saw the people there. 
I mean, young kids, I mean, 15, 16 years old, I mean, they were carrying 30 or 40 rounds of ammunition. Against the Sandinistas, they carry an average of 800 rounds. And all the, all the firepower and everything. And that's why I did it. And, you know, it's, and I'm not proud of it, but that's, that's the reason. In effect, uh, I mean, I hear you saying it was a very conscious kind of uh, reasoning process that you went through. It was one that was based on need, and you said uh, we need the money, and therefore we're willing to take it from uh, George Morales or from anybody else. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And, and, uh, let me add a little bit. Not only the troops, the troops operating in the field, they have to be based and in a large amount of, of uh, supporters. Now, the troops, you can move them from one place to another, uh, and they have at least 30 or 40 rounds for defense. What do you do with the campesinos then? Let me ask you a question, Mr. Huh? Cesar, and I, I don't want to get overly moralistic here or something, right. but I want to ask you the question because you, you talk about your need and the need to uh, take money uh, from where it was necessary in order to support your effort, correct? Right, right. What happens uh, if the results of the taking of that money are that more kids die on the streets of American cities because they take drugs? Ah, that's a different story. I was never involved in drug traffic. No, I know like, that. Like, I understand that. I'm, you I'm were not never saying... involved in murder, and you became a partner with Stalin, and he murdered millions of people in there. Uh, I am totally against the drug traffic. And the... Uh, but the money that comes from it can do anything it wants. No, sir. Uh, like I say, I'm not proud of that. But I uh, just didn't have any choice. I mean, the, the U.S. Congress didn't give us any choice. And uh, they got these people into a war. These people went inside of Nicaragua, 80 miles inside. They have thousands of supporters, campesinos there, helping them, feeding them. Now, when those people retreat, those campesinos were murdered by the Sandinistas. Uh, I don't agree with either of them. But that's the reality of life. Well, I think the testimony obviously speaks for itself and speaks pretty powerfully. I personally uh, <coughs> liked uh, Octaviano Cesar and respect him in many ways. He's a very committed person. Uh, but obviously, as he himself said, uh, that doesn't excuse what was done. We are going to uh, recess. Uh, we will come back. And Mr. George Morales uh, will testify when we return, and we will pick this up at 2.30. We're recessed till 2.30.